of uh, bringing the story of three seas to the world and, and sharing the, the excitement uh, of potential and the people that we have in, the, in, in, in this region. Now, in, uh, in recently published Global Risk Report uh, for 2024, the World Economic Forum is, is actually not painting a rosy, a rosy picture. Uh, they are talking about the different kinds of threats ranging from AI supported misinformation, disinformation, and uh, the shortages of uh, resources, climate changes, inflation, etc., etc. But I think the, the key is not, is not about the risks, but how we address these. And I think the, the, the three C's region is. Uh, is exactly the point how collaboration and cross-border uh, cooperation can provide for addressing shortcomings for actually working for for uh, for common future and um, and benefiting from from that. This is a region of 125 million people with the investment needs exceeding 650 billion uh, euro only to bring the uh, infrastructure in the, that part of Europe to on par with what, uh, what is currently in the in the Western Western European Union. But that's not only this, is it is not the needs that is important, it's the potential what is here for actually making the business, but not only the making the business, making the life better. And we as a Polish development bank, we together with, with our friends, with the development institutions and development banks from the region, we have, seven, uh, five years ago, we have set up the Three Cs Initiative Investment Fund, uh, A, to, to, to invest in and, and develop in the region, but also to prove the concept that you can have a very exciting business opportunities in the, uh, in the Three Cs countries. We have managed to raise uh, about 1 billion euro in capital, and we have deployed basically the entire sum in, in five different projects that are addressing the, the, uh, the investment needs and investment potential in the three seas countries. And this has already generated the additional value of six billion euro for the economies of the, um, uh, of the, uh, of the region. Uh, and um, well, I think we will see, we will discuss a lot about it today and tomorrow and, and, and Thursday. So let me put a stop here and let me give the floor to the distinguished panelists, please. Thank you, Pavel. Thank you for, for those remarks. And uh, thank you for the leadership that you and BGK have provided to the 3Cs, the standing up of the 3Cs Initiative Investment Fund. So my name is Ian Brzezinski. I'm a senior fellow in Atlanta Council. And it's a real privilege uh, here in Davos, this beautiful morning, sunny morning here in Davos, uh, to help moderate this panel, 3Cs as a driver of European growth. And for those of you who don't know, the 3Cs Initiative is an effort by 13 EU member states between the Baltic, uh, situated between the Baltic, Black, and Adriatic Seas, uh, who co combining their resources to accelerate the development of cross-border energy, transport, and digital infrastructure in that region. It's all about leveraging the power of cross-border infrastructure to, and the connectivity that comes with it to drive economic growth in the region, to reinforce economic resilience, and to strengthen Europe's military security. It's all about self-initiative. This is what strikes me about the three Cs. It's a, it's, it's a regional initiative of self-initiative and collaboration to harness the power of the free market to fulfill <coughs> complete the vision of a single European market and a Europe that's undivided, free, and secure, because infrastructure is the underpinning of, the, of that vision. And as Pavel, as Pavel pointed out, the three Cs region is well positioned for success in this endeavor. Got 125 million people. That accounts for 25% of the EU uh, population. It's got $2 trillion in GDP, and it features some of Europe's highest growth rates and rates of return for direct investment. So it's no surprise that the Three Seas region can be considered a driver of European growth. And with that said, let me introduce our, our panel. Uh, we have here in blue in, in, in the center 
are Her Excellency Maria Gabrielle, the Deputy Prime Minister and Foreign Minister of Bulgaria, and she previously served as a European Commissioner for Innovation, Research, Culture, Education, and Youth, and before that, as a European Commissioner for Digital Economy and Security. Immediately to my left, we have Mr. the Governor, Governor no 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 Nobumitsu Hayashi. <laughs> I hope I got that right. <laughs> Thank you. He's the Governor of the, of the Japan Bank for International Cooperation. This is a, a state-owned financial institution. He's a career civil servant. He served as a senior advisor to the Japanese Prime Minister and was director of the Japan, uh, director for Japan at the World Bank. Uh, in, in pink, uh, next to Fred Kemp, is Ms. Beata Daczynska Mujica, who's a special representative of the President of the Republic of Poland for the Three Seas. She recently just ended her tenure as the director of BGK, the Polish Development Bank. She led the establishment of the Three Seas Initiative Investment Fund and has been a powerful leader of the Three Seas Initiative. President, not president. Oh, no, president, excuse me, excuse me, president of, uh, of, the, of BGK. And, then, and uh, Ms. Fred Kemp, President and CEO of the Atlantic Council, my boss. Before taking the helm of the council in 2007, he had a 25 year career as an award winning journalist and author, uh, journalist at the Wall Street uh, Journal. So, with that said, let me start um, with our two regional uh, representatives here uh, the Foreign Foreign Minister and uh, uh, Beata. I want to explore, you know, what distinguishes the three seas region that makes it such so attractive for a foreign direct investment, such a, a dynamic economic region. What's, what's special, what's different about Central Eastern Europe, Austria, and, and, and Greece uh, that makes it a driver of European growth? Well, first, I would like to thank the Atlantic Council for organizing this discussion. I think that that's a great opportunity for all of us to see how we can transform the challenges into opportunities. Because I think that first, the region has enormous strengths. Uh, maybe I will start with some harmonized legislations because of the European law, and it's always good to have the legal predictability for any investment. I think that we have already the free movement of goods, uh, services, and persons. There is a very business-friendly environment, a dynamic market, and something else. This region, it's of strategic importance. Now, with Russia's aggression in Ukraine, we can see the region as the counterbalance for geopolitical challenges, because we would like to improve mm -hmm. the connectivity, we would like to much more regional cooperation, we would like to diversify and restore supply chains to talk, to talk about how we can reduce dependencies. So you can see that in the middle of all these we have a strength that is to be future-oriented because we count already on a very solid base. And I would like to add here the role of talents because this region is full of plenty of talents, engineers, the young people in the IT sector. And I must say, I even would like to add women in science, young researchers in ICT. So you can see that with talents, with business-friendly environment, with already facilities for investors, and because of the strategic importance of the region, there is a huge potential to unlock. Mm -hmm. Can you elaborate a little bit more on, on the potentials you're trying to unleash mm -hmm. uh, here in Central and Eastern Europe? If you allow me, uh, good morning, everybody. It, if, if you allow me to, um, to start with the, the, uh, the, the broader context, because if we are deeply involved in the Tracy's region, we understand this region, we represent this region. So we assume that everybody understands this region perfectly as we understand this region. Uh, but it is uh, very important to give some context how this Tracy's was established how this Tracy's initiative was established by our presidents, the 12 presidents. Uh, and uh, it was a very important moment in New York in 2015. And it is very important to underline that it was the United Nations Summit, and we discussed, and uh, the United Nations signed a very important agreement between countries, Agenda 2030. And one of the points uh, of this agenda, it is how we build the sustainable development in, uh, across the world. And one of these uh, points is how to build the connectivity and the axis north-south, not only to develop the east-west-west-east connectivity, 
that is obvious. And maybe for uh, Japan, it is north south. It is obvious, but for the rest of the the the, the, the countries, uh, and especially for Europe, uh, the the most uh, supply chains is, is only east west, and uh, during this uh, fantastic uh, summit. Uh, the mother and father, as we used to call uh, our President Duda and uh, President Croatia, uh, Kolinda Grabar Kitarovic, he was uh, the, 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 the first uh, president who established this uh, initiative. Uh, the first summit was in Dubrovnik, the second summit was in, in Poland, uh, 12 countries with a huge potential. But we represent the central eastern part of European Union with the history with the Iron Curtain. So we have a lot of infrastructure gaps, especially on the axis north-south. Uh, this calculation was presented by Pavel, by you, that if we want to have the same quality of infrastructure, which exists already in the western part of Europe, we have to invest up to 2030 uh, over 650 billion euro. But not for the entire infrastructure, only in three sectors, energy, digital, and logistic and transportation. This is a huge amount of money. And it's uh, worth to underline that the, these figures represent the report before war, before crisis, before the, 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 the huge inflation across the world. So probably we have to spend, spend more and more money. But this context of the, the, the uh, three Cs region, and the, as you mentioned about the three Cs, exactly three Cs, uh, Baltic, Adriatic and the Black Sea, it is huge uh, entrance to these gates between our ports and how we build the uh, infrastructure resilience, strategic infrastructure, it will be the answer how we can boost our economy and how we can speed up to develop the entire region. And this region in the deglobalization and the global context, it's more and more and more important. And I am very proud as a, the, the former president of BGK together, and I would like to thank you, my, my colleagues from the management board, that during the second summit in Poland, we're sitting together across the, 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 the in, in the boardroom, and uh, because the, the whole uh, Warsaw was closed, all streets was closed because it was summit. The number of representatives from the <coughs> number of uh, countries and okay, so what we can do as a financial institution for this brilliant initiative? Okay, we have enough uh, knowledge and experience and competences to set up the international investment fund and encourage our colleagues from the other countries like Bulgaria and the other uh, in development institutions. Let's uh, set up the fund as a trigger uh, to interest uh, this region and invest in this region. So today the, the story is uh, developing and I'm very happy that we can discuss, discuss not only in Davos, when the policymakers are discussing about the future of uh, the, 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 the global economy, but as you see, we have the huge representation as a three Cs new opportunities hub here in Davos. So it is my pleasure to share with you uh, these opportunities with the audience. Thank you. Thank you. So you know, you we're addressing a, a legacy of Soviet occupation. It's created an infrastructure gap that you're estimating to be uh, about 600 to 700 billion dollars when compared or what it would be needed to invest in cross-border infrastructure so that Central and Eastern Europe can match the infrastructural level that you find in, in, in Western Europe. And you're trying to unleash the potential of the region through this, and you created this investment fund to catalyze uh, that development. Let me get the perspective from outside of the region. Uh, um, and uh, Governor Hayashi, give, give us a sense of, you know, from, from Japan, from the Indo-Pacific, how are you looking at the Three Seas region, and what, what what, what, what do you find appealing and interesting about it? What, what motivates uh, uh, Japanese firms to look at, at this region, and what sectors are perhaps of greatest interest to them? Well, thank you very much. Yes, I am uh, from outside, and um, here or 
uh, back in Bucharest when we have, I, I attended the business forum, I, I'm always one of the very few Asian people present. So why I am interested in three Cs and why I'm here, let me tell you. Uh, well, the first thing is that uh, three Cs is, is about connectivity, as, uh, as Beata said. Connectivity in technology, in energy, and in transportation. But I want to stress tra uh, to connectivity in energy. Uh, because there has to be a lot more investment in this region because many countries are dependent either on coal or either on Russia. So, and um, at the COP meeting in Dubai, uh, there, there was uh, very strong uh, recognition that we have to invest more in renewable energy to triple renewable energy, energy by 2030 or to triple. Uh, nuclear energy uh, by 2050. Well, I agree with that. That's why we are investing in the U.S. company New Scale, which has the most advanced SMR technology, and we are cooperating to build it in, uh, in Romania by 2030. So these are things that we're doing, but what's lacking is the connectivity in energy. You have to spend much more in bringing um, the, the countries and the economies together well, it's not, uh, investing in power grids is not as, as politically sexy or, or attractive as adding one gigawatt or 10 gigawatt in, in your uh, ele electricity, but it is important. That's why we are financing connection between the UK or Germany or between Saudi and Egypt. And Japanese companies have a, a good, very good technology in direct account high voltage connection. So that what we would, would like to see and would like to do in this region. And also 3Cs is about innovation and digitalization. And there are so many good, talented people, tech people in this region, so we know that. So we set up a few years ago, uh, our venture capital fund in the Nordic and Baltic countries, which happens to be called Nordic Ninja. No. And uh, last year we set up the second fund and we'll be investing in high-tech digitalization and uh, uh, sustainability area. And uh, we brought such excellent Japanese companies as Honda, Panasonic, and Omron and tried to see the joint ventures between the, those, those startups and Japanese companies. So this is what we are going to do as we see the gravity of Europe is moving more and more eastward. And finally, for, for me, three C's is about partnership with the people in the region and with the institutions in the re region. And um, f for me, it has been very, very important that is, is that we have a partnership with uh, Madame Muzutica <laughs> and uh, VGK. I, I can't thank Beata more uh, uh, of uh, leadership and uh, friendship. So uh, BGK issued samurai bond in Tokyo, which JBIC guaranteed 93 billion yen, the first samurai bond issue. And it meets the fiscal needs of the government of Poland in generously, most generously welcoming the people of Ukraine, the women and children and handicapped people in Poland. So we are very proud of it. And President Zelensky in his meeting in Hiroshima at the G7 last year with Prime Minister, they, they talked and, and President Zelensky is thanked about that. And uh, we're still working on with uh, BGK what we can do further uh, to, to take opportunity of um, this uh, partnership. We are partnering partnership in with the Exim Bank of Romania or USDFC or US Exim Bank to uh, try to find what more we can do. Uh, you may know that Prime Minister Kishida of Japan said what's happening in Ukraine may happen in Asia tomorrow. Well, we may be far away, but, uh, well, you're surrounded by three Cs, but Japan happens to be surrounded by four Cs. Uh, I'm not quite sure, but you, <laughs> you know that. That is Pacific Ocean, the Sea of Japan, huh. and the um, Sea of Okhotsk, and East China Sea. We are a neighbor to Russia, a neighbor to China. So what's happening in the Ukraine is, is not a faraway thing. We feel quite strong solidarity with the people in the region. And uh, we want, uh, based on such partnership, we want to contribute to connectivity and to, um, uh, to innovation and to economic growth in the region. Thank you.
It's a really important point you make about Ukraine, and I hope we'll get a little bit into what the three C's relationship with Ukraine can be. But before, to, before I do that, let me turn, turn to Fred Kemp, uh, because the Atlantic Council has been involved with three C's from, from the very beginning. And perhaps you could share with us, you know, your perspective on, on, on the three C's region and perhaps your insights into America's perspective on the three C's, both geopolitically and in terms of the economic opportunities it presents for American businesses. Yeah, well, thank you so much, Ian. And, and, and first of all, let me salute uh, Bayat and, and your, your leadership, and we, we should say, is also proud to have you on our International Advisory Board of the Atlantic Council. And Pavel, uh, it's just been such a pleasure working with you on, on this, and you brought this a long way. Um, I also want to congratulate Ian. Um, so in 2014, Ian was involved in a report um, uh, chaired by General Jim Jones, uh, former Supreme Allied Commander, the former Chairman of the Atlantic Council. Um, and, uh, uh, and then Pavel Oknovich, who was then the head of Grupo Motos in, in Poland, Polish Energy Company. And it was a, it was a oh, I'm sorry. It was a it was uh, it was it was a groundbreaking. I, I don't need to repeat myself for the first one. <laughs> it was a groundbreaking report in 2014. Um, where, um, uh, and it was called Completing Europe. Uh, we didn't come up with the term three C's. At that point, we called it a North-South Corridor. And anyone who wants to understand the power of the North-South Corridor in Central and Eastern Europe has to understand, uh, has, has to fast forward to February of 2022 and understand what happens when you rely too much on the East-West Corridor. Uh, suddenly, uh, you have an invasion of uh, Ukraine, <coughs> illegal, unprovoked. Uh, you have the whole uh, of uh, Western Europe's energy system thrown into chaos. Um, and uh, and uh, if they had thought more about interconnectivity, not east-west, but around uh, the European Union, and uh, not just north-south, but also north-south, I think you would have had less of an energy crisis at that time. And so uh, I think this notion of completing Europe, you have to say three C's dash completing Europe, because this really fulfills or goes toward fulfilling President George H.W. Bush's uh, vision of a Europe whole and free, that, which was the vision at the end of the Cold War after the, uh, the Berlin Wall fell. Um, I see the three C's uh, um, as an economic arm uh, of, 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 of completing Europe. Uh, but the geopolitical necessity that goes hand in hand with it is uh, that Ukraine has to pr prevail uh, in, in uh, the war that Putin has launched against us. Uh, and we'll get to that in a minute, as Ian said, but I don't think you can see them separately. I, th I think three C's is an important piece of a jigsaw puzzle, a very important part of that puzzle uh, uh, to complete Europe. Now, I, am, uh, I also wear another hat here, which is I'm on an advisory council of something called the Development Finance Corporation, which has put forward $300 million for this project. Uh, and I was very uh, supportive of that, wearing that separate, wearing that separate hat. <laughs> so we've got 13 member states, 2.17 billion um, uh, in GDP, or 13% of the European Union's GDP. Um, 120 million people, 25% of the EU population. So 13% of EU GDP, 25% of its population, but growing faster than the rest. Yeah, so in 2021, you had 11% growth in Poland, 10.5% Lithuania, and so forth. I'm so glad I, uh, you gave the, your, your point of view on this uh, from Japan. And I'm, I'm glad you talked about New Scale. Because you talked about the $1 billion that's available, we've talked about the money that's being invested. But my vision for this is a map uh, that doesn't just include the investment uh, facility, but includes everything that's been invested. Uh, I think that's the only way you can look at the power of the three seas region, that it isn't one invest. New Scales pr uh, project in Romania should be seen as part of the three seas project. Uh, and uh, with a US company, uh, uh, it's uh, working together with you, um, uh, but uh, doing uh, small modular uh, nuclear plants, uh, uh, where we also have some really interesting Polish companies that are involved in that. So I, my, my vision, is, uh, my vision, my hope is that, uh, is that the three C's will view itself in a more expansive way 
including projects that are not technically considered right now by, uh, as part of the three C's, but I have an even more radical uh, belief, and that is that the uh, three C's project should get ahead of the European Union uh, in inviting Ukraine in as a member. Uh, uh, and I, I think it would send a heavy signal that this is really what this project is about uh, and was always intended to be about uh, building a north-south corridor of these three C's. And, and then while we're at it, let's throw in the, the Western Balkans as well. Well, following on that point on Ukraine, let's step back a little bit and let me ask, how has the volatility of the last couple of years affected the Three Seas region's economic growth, its role as a driver of European uh, growth? I mean, we've had the ups and downs of the economy consequent to COVID, and of course now we have the really urgent crisis of Russia's brutal and unjustified invasion of, of Ukraine, which is right on the frontier of, of, of the Three Seas. Beata, how has that affected the Three Seas Initiative? How has that affected the region's economy and its attractiveness to foreign direct investment? Yes, this is uh, the, the story about the threats and uh, the opportunities. Always the threats it is uh, equal with the opportunities that we can create. Uh, of course, uh, the, the war in Ukraine it is a new perspective that we have to look on the, uh, our responsibility as a countries, as a neighbor countries in, in uh, uh, in this region and the infrastructure that we have to build in this region, it is crucial how in the future we can support Ukraine effectively. On the other hand, if we are thinking to support Ukraine only to the one hub in Rzeszów, it won't be possible. We have to speed up to build the in, uh, infrastructure uh, uh, and especially the roads and rail, which is crucial, but not only because the energy infrastructure is, is uh, so important as well, uh, and the digital infrastructure also. Uh, <coughs> let me give you the two examples uh, of the infrastructure and what is the, the, the huge uh, challenge that we have in our region. Uh, the same distance. Uh, between Tallinn and Sofia. How long it takes to get by train from Tallinn to Sofia? If anybody can guess? Two and a half days. Uh, how long it ta takes the same distance on the western part of Europe? Two hours. Fifteen hours. Uh, the border between Bulgaria and Romania. Bridges. Two bridges and the river, uh, which is 458 kilometers. Two bridges. So if we want to effectively support Ukraine, if we want to build the, the resilience, we have to invest. And uh, give me also the, the example what we already did as a country, because uh, this is not only the private money, this is not only a story about the public money, uh, this is the story about the, the common effort by public money, private investors, and the PPP projects. Uh, uh, only four years, 18, 19, uh, five years, sorry, 18, uh, 19, 20, 21, and 22. Uh, all countries for these three sectors spent over 80, 88 zero, uh, 80 billion euro for this infrastructure. So we are making a progress constantly to fill in the gaps in our infrastructure. But taking into account the, 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 the shaking wall, uh, world, uh, the, the war in Ukraine, uh, the, 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 the war in the other places uh, uh, across the world, we have to speed up to, to build the infrastructure because it means for us it is from one hand it is challenge, from the other hand it is opportunity. How to be ready to answer for some needs from the other countries that we can play in the future the very important role in the global economy, in the global supply chain. Uh, and of course we used to repeat the 12 countries. Of course we have right now the 13 countries because the, the Greece, uh, as you mentioned, it is uh, the, the new member of the uh, three seas countries. So we have probably now the five seas, not only three seas. <laughs> uh, but it it gives you uh, it gives you the context uh, that taking into account the the geographical uh, uh, situation and the investment effort, 
we will be ready to answer for this huge uh, uh, huge challenge in Ukraine. As you know, everybody discuss about uh, how to support Ukraine, how to rebuild Ukraine. And there is a lot of question, who invest, how to invest, what uh, about the, the threats, what is the risk profile, uh, who give the guarantee for, for this investment. How about the, the corruption? We talk about this uh, many times. So there is a lot of question, but only through the partnership that we create as a 13 countries, with the strategic partnership with US, European Union, Germany, I would like to underline that the Germany that is uh, that one of the strategic country for, for the three Cs, and of course the, the new coming strategy uh, cooperation with Japan, and the other countries uh, from the uh, from the Asia, I think it is a huge opportunity for us, but not only for us. In the current situation, it is global challenge, and we have to invest in this region together. Thank you, Minister Gabriel. Would you agree that uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has added urgency to the Three Seas Initiative? And if so, have you seen that urgency shared by your Three Seas counterparts? across the region? Absolutely. I think that it was very clearly said that I want to support this idea. Investing in the countries uh, within this region is really investing in our security, in our resilience, in our future, and it's investing in the future of Ukraine. I think that it's first when we talk about infrastructure, of course that we need to address the gaps, and I think that we need to address another issue how we create synergies with the other funds. And here um, I'm talking about the European funds, for example. I, cl I see very, very clear synergies between what we have as connectivity and digital and digital Europe program, connecting Europe facility and transport to see how we can ensure complementarity between, because we are fully aware that investments will need much more. But I think that the key word here is create synergies in order to address much more rapidly with better implementation, with better regional cooperation, these <coughs> gaps in the infrastructure. Second point, I would like definitely to support the idea of innovation. That was always my position, and remember that was one of the results during the summit in Sofia in 2021. This idea to create the innovation fund was submitted. I fully believe that we need this innovation fund. We need to innovate because it's true that we have public funds, we have private investments. We need to talk about venture capital equity. We need to fund the funds. We need to innovate in order to attract a new generation of innovators and investors that are very flexible, that are quite smart, and that are seeing the strategic importance of, of this region. And third, it's definitely uh, this idea of more partnerships. But for me, that means that we have a challenge ahead of us to establish some priorities, because we know what's happened. Uh, you, Beata, you already told us the entire legacy. We remember how suddenly there was hundreds and hundreds of projects. I think that we should take a little bit of time, and now, especially with what's happened in Ukraine, to establish some priorities, to invest in this, because that there will be an added value, because that will make a difference. And I'm sure that the different countries within the, 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 the initiative are ready for that. I have myself an example. We were in New York for Junga, and we signed a common declaration between Croatia, Greece, Bulgaria, and Romania in order to identify now, the next few months, what are our three main priorities, three projects in which we'll invest heavily in order to improve infrastructure, north-south corridors, reduce dependencies. And I think that it's really time a little bit to, to move in this direction too. Especially the cross-border projects. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So I'm going to follow on, on, on Fred's push, but start with the, the, with the governor. Here we're talking about Ukraine. From your perspective, should the three C's look at Ukraine as a risk or as an opportunity and a responsibility? I mean, how would it affect your outlook if they were to more deeply engage Ukraine? How would it affect your outlook on the Three Seas Initiative? Well, it's definitely a risk if you look at what's happening. But um, risk, wh where there is risk, there is always opportunity. That's how we, the business people, think about. So uh, despite all the risks and felt all the dangers, we want to find what are the opportunities in Ukraine or in the region. Uh, well, uh, well, be because JBIC is support commercial 
project and doesn't give grants or technical assistance. It's JICA, Japanese um, official agency to dealing with ODA that is now supporting uh, the Ukraine and, and the people of Ukraine. Uh, there's a s really an established network of auto companies or electric companies in the region, including Ukraine, but mostly in, in Eastern Europe. We want to, to help them. Uh, but as for the, for the time being, Japanese companies are not very keen on investing more at this moment, but we are ready to do it. And, and um, whatever the project in the eastern part uh, of Europe, which increases connectivity, whether it's energy or transportation or roads. We are very happy to do that. Uh, I know that over uh, River Janao, IHI uh, built a very bright um, suspension bridge. So that's the kind of technology Japanese companies can offer. We are an uh, uh, earthquake prone country. Uh, we just had a very severe earthquake at the beginning of this year. And so the resilience of infrastructure is very, very important for us. So we want to bring the things together. together. And also about innovation. Uh, yeah, I, I talked about the Ninja Fund. We also set up another venture fund last year, uh, focusing on Eastern Europe on industrial tech and factory automation. Uh, it is headquarters in in, in Warsaw and called FF Red and White. Uh, if you recall the flag of Japan and Poland, you can see why it's red and white. <laughs> but but uh, we are really keen uh, to take advantage of the very many talented people in the region in, in this economy. So th that's our approach. And um, encouraging Japanese companies' investment, Japanese companies' uh, business activities in the region, no matter what are the risks at this stage. So opportunity, or no, no <laughs> with risk comes reward. Yeah, yeah, because we are an official institution. We can take risk, and we can think in the long term. That's what we do. Fred, would you like to elaborate on it? Because you've been one of the strongest advocates for bringing Ukraine into the three Cs. Well, uh, <coughs> Sorry, Governor Hayashi, I find what you said very inspiring. Um, the, um, uh, we're in a contest uh, for the global future. Let's, let's just admit it. I, I've been calling it an inflection point for some time. And this inflection point is as crucial as the periods after World War I and World War II. Um, and if you look at it from a U.S. standpoint, you don't want to repeat what you repeated after World War I. Uh, which uh, led to fascism, uh, World War II, millions of dead, the Holocaust. What you do want to do is you want to do more of what happened after World War II, which is creating international connections, institutions, uh, uh, working with your allies to build. Uh, what we're hoping is that uh, it would have been nice uh, not to have a war in the meantime, but the war has at least galvanized uh, this um, conviction that we're at another inflection point. And so just like after World War I and after World War II and after the Cold War, when the Ukraine war is over, is going to offer a huge opportunity again to reinvigorate uh, uh, the connections among, among uh, free market democratic countries. Um, and, so, um, uh, and, and so not only do I see uh, uh, Ukrainian victory as a uh, a precondition for us all. Uh, what happens in Ukraine is going to have an impact that goes way beyond the borders of Ukraine uh, to, um, uh, to your part of the world and to calculations that China might make regarding Taiwan. Um, and so I think it's, it's absolutely important that Ukraine, we're all talking about reconstruction right now, but, for, but first you need to get a secure situation in Ukraine so that reconstruction can happen. Uh, and so I think at this point we have to give Ukraine all the support we can militarily, economically, with a very good plan to move forward quickly. And so there's, um, uh, there's uh, certainly a candidate uh, potential for uh, Ukraine in the European Union. Uh, I hope that will uh, evolve uh, with NATO as well. Uh, but I think Ukraine needs to be put in Western institutions not for the good of Ukraine, but for the good of the Western institutions and for the good of the West. Because if we can solidify this part of Europe, 
Uh, then we, we were talking about uh, uh, the region and how important, Ian, you're talking about what the region is. The center of gravity for the European Union is inevitably moving to the east. Uh, already has. Um, you already see this in terms of Poland and what's happening with Poland's economy. Uh, and I think that that will continue as, as uh, U uh, Ukraine stabilizes. I, I not only hope, but I expect it will over time. I hope it doesn't take as long um, uh, 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 that, that it creates more damage for the country. But I think that's the, that's the new Europe, the new European map. The center of gravity has moved east. And so I think it is absolutely crucial uh, uh, the, to embrace Ukraine, not just for Ukraine's sake, but for our own sake. I just can't help but adding, but you know, when, when you look at the three C's membership, these 13 states, there are 11 of them uh, uh, that have de very similar uh, experiences and history uh, with, with, with Ukraine. I mean, first of all, there's geographic proximity, uh, there's his, the historical interaction of the peoples, uh, the shared experience of Soviet occupation, uh, the unique lessons that the region has learned through its economic success and some of the mistakes it made in the progress uh, to EU membership and e economic growth. These are all applicable uh, to, to Ukraine as it struggles to reconstruct itself and integrate so itself into the, into the European Union. So it's a capability that I think gives the region a moral responsibility and it's an opportunity to demonstrate the re three C's leadership role in the reshaping of Europe and the completion of that vision of Europe that's undivided, free, free and secure. But let me talk about some of the kind of recent successes. And um, I mean, I'll talk to Beata again, but you know, one of the big developments of this year was a decision uh, after many years of negotiation by the United States Development Corporation to actually stand up a $300 million facility to support the three C's. How significant is that? Uh, thank you very much for this question. Uh, yes, it is uh, very significant uh, because uh, it gives uh, the, the opportunity for uh, another investment in region together with the U.S. development institution. So it is a very important signal for the entire region and the other investors. Uh, it is worth to invest in this region. So uh, this is not only the $300 uh, million dollars. This is not story about the three uh, hundred million dollars. This is uh, the story about the the partnership, uh, the belief in this region, and uh, the 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 huge opportunity through the economy that we represent and uh, the the fastest growing region. How we create the opportunities for the private investors. So I strongly believe that uh, that we, uh, after this uh, uh, first step, there will be the the opportunity or the encouragement for the other uh, private investors also to, to invest in this region. Uh, project by project, maybe f uh, through the new fund that uh, we are planning as, as a development institution to, to set up, especially for energy and, uh, and uh, digital, uh, because it is more how to say, more readable for the private investors uh, because uh, the logistic and transportation it is used to perceive uh, like roads and rail. Okay, it is not for the private investor, it is uh, rather for, for private public uh, investor and the government uh, decision. But let me underline that uh, another uh, opp uh, opportunities that we created the together as uh, business representatives. And uh, during the summit uh, uh, last year, we announced uh, the new body, uh, which was established by businesses. So association from Poland, Lithuania, Croatia, and uh, uh, I, I, I probably it is uh, another countries that decided to sign together uh, the notary did. Yes, we are ready to cooperate together as a representative of business and the companies from this region. And we set up the Trisys Business Development Association, which is registered uh, in, uh, in Brussels. So uh, it is uh, the, the only the starting point. But uh, I strongly believe it is uh, not only for the uh, uh, attractive the other investor, but also how we can cooperate and increase the, 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 the turnover between our region, be, uh, between our countries. So I strongly believe it will be a, uh, a fantastic idea and step by step we develop and uh, develop the business uh, through the 
our companies in, in this region. Uh, and uh, there is a lot of uh, ideas that we can implement. And let me remind the, 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 our conversation with uh, President Radev in, in uh, uh, Bulgaria when it was the, the um, summit in Sofia. And uh, we have a fantastic discussion. And uh, I asked him why we cannot, through the president, the head of state, encourage the young people why the three C's is so important. And I... Um, I suggest uh, maybe you, as a, the president of this country, can uh, give the inauguration lecture in the most important universities uh, in this region. But not for your country, but for the, the neighbor of uh, this, uh, in this region. So Mr. Radev go to, uh, can go to Estonia, Estonian president go to Croatia and others because we don't uh, need only the involvement of the official uh, governments, uh, head of states, uh, but also the young people, because the TRISIS initiatives, this is not story, the, the current situation, this is a story for next generation and for the future. And then if we go to the deputy prime minister. The creation of this business association, Bayad, is one of the wonderful things that you and others have helped bring about. Because as long as it was an intergovernmental situation, it, good to see government support, good to see that governments wanted to work together, but it's really the business opportunity that's going to unlock it. Uh, and so I also like the fact that you're talking about the next generation as well, but congratulations on the business association. But now the business association sh should get active and give the government some ideas about what they might be able to do to make this go faster. Yeah, well, I'd like also to support uh, how important was the message uh, by the creation of this business development association. And it's not on Harza that now all the time we have the summit and we have the business forum. And we are all waiting for next April to see in Lithuania how it will go. Uh, because for me, they have a very, very special responsibility. Of course, they will talk about solutions, challenges, but they can give much more visibility to already the success stories, because some of them are real success stories, some of the members that are now part of this association. And second, I would like uh, also to support this, uh, this idea of how to involve much more young people in this initiative. And we have even a very concrete example. I shared this during the summit in Bucharest. I was the head of the delegation this year, but we discussed with President Radov before. I, now at European level, we have the, the European alliances of universities. That's our European universities of the future. It's seven, 13 universities working together, specialized on some topics, health or climate. Why we don't have a European alliance of universities dedicated to the issues of energy, transport, and connectivity because that is the three C's initiative. I think it's just a question really to start to, li to, to, to be a little bit more vocal about the idea, and that's, that will be one of the, the good examples we, if we can create this. Well, you have the mic. Let me ask a question based leveraging your experience on the European Commission. What should the three C's be doing to deepen its relationship with, 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 with the Commission, with the European Union? Well, first, I think that the European Commission is already supporting the initiative, but what we would like to see now is a much, much more deep cooperation. And that's why I'm talking about synergies, because uh, we are talking about complementarities, how we can crea create these complementarities with what already the European Commission is doing. We have the Common Agricultural Fund, we have the Ener Energy Fund, we have different programs that are here to address these issues of regional infrastructures, much, much more connectivity. And I think that we need to talk a little bit more concretely. It's good that we need a bridge on the Danube, but where is the Connecting Europe facility? Where is uh, the Danube program? Where is the Danube strategy? Where is the European Regional Development Fund? The same when we talk about the, how to reduce uh, the dependency on energy. I think that first, the European Commission have a very good program on hydrogen. The biggest partnership on clean hydrogen is a European one. We have a very strong focus on small modular reactors, the next generations. So I think that that will be a great momentum to seize because we have European elections in only a few months. In the beginning of the next commission to talk a little bit more concretely, identifying those priorities and creating synergies with the European programs and with what was already done with the 3Cs initiative and where we can have a common future. 
No, I may right. one sentence. We have uh, other five uh, biggest development uh, banks uh, last year in May in, uh, in Madrid. Uh, a lot of discussion about how to invest, what is the role of development institution, and so on, so on, and together with the European Union and the EU Commission, how we uh, can uh, support the development of the uh, European Union. And with, uh, not where, the most of uh, Western uh, development institutions start to discuss about the Caribbean countries and uh, South America. And I ask, why you don't think about the Central Eastern part of Europe? Because we are the younger uh, sisters and brothers of the European Union. And firstly, if we, would, uh, we are thinking about the uh, build a stronger entire European Union, we have to invest here in Europe, in central eastern part of Europe. Especially, we are the eastern flank of NATO and we are the, the neighbors of the Ukraine where there is regular war. And we have to be ready to answer for these challenges for the European Union before we are going to the uh, Caribbean. Or, I, well, that's the foreign minister who is speaking diplomacy, it's important and we need really to have friends and allies and partners. I think that it's simply important to identify the like-minded partners, those with whom we share common ambitions. We already have some common standards, a level of, of technological development. We share the same democratic values, and it's possible to identify these partnerships that will bring a definitely added value, because Japan is an important partner, and in Caribbean region, we have important partners too. I think that, again, here the challenge is to decide really to do things, to prioritize, and after <laughs> step by step to realize it as soon as possible because we are facing global challenges, because, but because we are together, we can address them in a different way. And, so it's, also about, and it's also about marketing. That's why I think this association is so important, mm -hmm. constantly press the opportunities of the region. But we're coming up on the end of our time, so I want to just go into one speed round. <laughs> L looking forward, in April, Lithuania will host the next 3C Summit in Business Forum. What do you think ought to be the deliverables f f at, at that event? What do you think ought to be the activities and priorities of the 3Cs looking forward to make the region even more attractive to foreign investment? And I'll start with the governor and just walk. Yeah, well, thank you very much. Yes, uh, well, for example, hydrogen is a very important piece to connect more together the countries in the region. Well, I talked about the chances and opportunities, but I have to say again, uh, I have to add that uh, each economy in the region is very small. And uh, business people wouldn't want to invest in a small economy where the labor market or the, uh, the market is very s limited. So we have to, you have to bring more and more together in terms of physical connectivity and also policy connectivity. You have to have a more consistent and transparent and united policy to, to sell uh, three C's area to the business people. Well, people think of investing in Poland or investing in Bulgaria in terms of that they're in the EU and relatively cheap labor, but not think of three C's as a market. So there has to be a more and more powerful move upon the petition and from the business community to sell the region as a business opportunity. Thank you. I was hoping you were going to say in an investment from the <laughs> Japan <laughs> Bank. Well, 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 if you do that, investment will come, and we here, are here. ready to support them. Minister. Well, I expect confirmation of our support for Ukraine. I think that it's really important, but starting to identify the different projects on which we can work together. Of course, more innovation and new technologies, hydrogen, but also batteries, solar renewables, and all these questions we need now to think about this uh, green transition, net, net, net zero technologies. Cybersecurity, I very much hope this part of uh, Europe is very well known for, for that because we need to secure um, and, well, I'm sure that there will be a little bit more discussion about military mobility because that, let's not forget we are all members of the European Union but we are also members of, the, of NATO and we are facing a crucial phase. My personal wish is maybe to start finally to talk about the empowerment of women in innovation in ICT and the role of women in young researchers in these topics. Yeah. 
I fully agree with uh, Governor Hayashi that we have to find a way how to represent ourselves as a Trisis region and a huge opportunity as an entire region for the private inv investor especially because uh, every single small country is not enough attractive for the uh, big investors. So we have to, and I strongly believe uh, through the Trisis summit, we spread the information about the entire region and only common effort to represent ourselves together together uh, as a huge opportunity for the private inv investors. It is uh, one that I strongly believe that we will be able to achieve after the Trisis Summit in Vilnius. And uh, of course, the Trisis Business Development Association, uh, it will be another step to underline this is uh, the way how we want to cooperate in the entire region and the business first. And there will be the and more opportunities for the PPP project, private public uh, partnership. Fred? So we're in a competition to decide what set of values, what set of countries, what set of institutions are going to define the future. The three C's, I think, has to be seen in that light. And so I would argue for changing the map. And I change the map in two ways. First of all, I would change the map in bringing in the projects that are not counted at the moment as part of the Three Seas Project. I'm happy at the Atlantic Council to create that map if people want to work with us to do this, but your own new scale project should be there in Romania. Uh, the uh, Intel uh, plan to do a semiconductor plant in Poland. Uh, you know, uh, Goldman Sachs has major operations in Warsaw. Amazon uh, opening a corporate office in Romania. You know, uh, yes, it should be cross-border, but also just seeing how the marketing excitement of this becoming an exciting place to invest. And then finally, the second way I would change the map is I would bring in uh, Ukraine, perhaps Moldova, perhaps Western Balkans. It is so hard to get in the European Union. It's going to take so many years. Three Cs ought to make it easier. And, and you can get a jump start uh, on, on the European Union. So I would change the map in those two ways. I agree with Fred. I would, my big hope with Vilnius would be an invitation for Ukraine, and that would highlight the role and the leadership of the Three Cs initiative. It would create new opportunities uh, for the Three Cs. I think I'd complement that with a tangible infrastructure project that pulls, you know, that, that goes across a Three Cs country's border in, into Ukraine. That's tangible, that's operational, and it would underscore the power and potentials of the Three Seas region, and it's the right thing to do. So with that- Before we close, I want to salute Ian Brzezinski. There is nobody in Washington, nobody in the United States who has been more of a champion for Three Seas, and so he's moderating, but he's the expert. <laughs> <laughs> well, with, that, with that said, let me, let me thank our panelists. We've had a great discussion on that to underscore the you know, economic vibrancy of the Three Seas region, the role, its role as a driver of, of European growth. We've explored the rationale and the need for the Three Seas initiative, its emphasis on infrastructure, and we had a great discussion looking forward on how it can become even more effective in, in its effort to complete the vision of a Europe that's undivided, whole, and free. So thank you all.
Welcome everyone, and thank you very much for coming. Uh, let me first say that uh, the economic growth of the Three Seas region over the past couple of decades has been one of the greatest success stories in the recent European history. The 10 CEE countries have grown over the course of the past 15 years, their per capita GDP by more than 120%. Now in 1990, a country like Estonia had a GDP per capita that was equivalent to the GDP per capita of Papua New Guinea. Today, Estonia is a country that has more unicorns per capita than any other place in the world. Poland, on the other hand, hosts enormous R&D centers of our best tech companies. Um, Ukraine, on the other hand, has developed itself into a leader in GovTech and defense technologies. And my humble country, Slovenia, for example, hosts the UNESCO's AI Center. So we've gone a very, very long way. And today, I'm proud to say that our region boasts more than 30 unicorns. Now, the digital revolution, as we all know, has been the key, or let's say one of the key drivers of this economic miracle. Our societies have been quick to adopt new technologies and see whatever new trend is coming as an opportunity rather than a risk. Our citizens have been early adopters when it comes to all kinds of new technologies from e-banking all the way to ride sharing. Our entrepreneurs have been quick to emerge on the global tech stage with their services as well as new business models. And our governments have played an important part as well by promoting pro-digital and pro-innovation public policies. Today, we are going to discuss how to build on this solid foundation to create a digital region of the future, a region of champions. I'm delighted to be joined by excellent, or let's say one of the key young leaders of this region's digital transformation, starting with Ms. Rita Balok, who is the Europe lead in Google's international government affairs teams. We have Mr. Martin Vesovsky, who's a chief futurist at SAP, and Mr. Viktor Schmidt, who's an executive chairman and of NetGuru. Now, we've all heard of Google, we've all heard of SAP, but Victor, let me ask you first, what does your company do? Because I think it's one of the most exciting companies to ever come from our region. Thank you, that's so, that's so kind. And thank you for, for the uh, invitation. Yeah, so we focus on, on actually the implementation of a lot of the things that we'll be talking, we'll be talking about today. So we work with um, corporates and startups and scale-ups and we help them build digital products. And I would say probably half of the conversations we have with our clients uh, today are, are starting with AI. And uh, they don't always end with AI, you know, prototype or, 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 or product, but, but definitely there's a huge interest in this space. Um, and that's what we focus uh, on with our clients. Thank you, Victor, and uh, congratulations. Now let's start with an open-ended question. And I would like to ask each of the panelists, how do you envision the three C's region of the future, or let's say the digital central in Eastern Europe in 10, 15, perhaps 20 years. And let's start with you, Rita. Happy to. Thank you so much for the invitation. It's a real pleasure to be here with you today. Uh, from a Google perspective, the Central European region is a very, very exciting one. I think one of the most impressive statistics, you quoted 120%. I think for Poland, the growth rate was 170% or something along those lines for the past 25 years. And from the statistics that I've seen, um, digital, as you mentioned, is a huge driver of this growth. And we're here in Davos, everybody's talking about AI, so you are not going to be surprised that I'm also just want to pause of how much more potential there is if we accelerate the AI-driven uh, digital transformation. And we often think about AI as chatbot. Um, AI is so much more than just a chatbot. It's a fundamental technological scientific breakthrough and innovation. Um, Sundar, our CEO, often says AI is akin to magic, and it's going to be similar to what we've seen when the internet um, came about. 
And so we, s we, we are already seeing and going to see even more innovation and breakthroughs in the medical um, space. So for example, Google DeepMind was the one inventing AlphaFold. And it's a uh, technology to help us understand how proteins are folding, which may sound, you know, very um, uh, technical, but or 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 geeky. But it's super important when you start thinking about personalized medicine. We are also Google DeepMind is also thinking about how can we categorize. Um, and better understand what um, uh, 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 changes in your body are malignant or beneficial, and we're working really closely with the medical community on that. Um, there are breakthroughs in cybersecurity, which I think for in, in this region and the free seas, it's one of a, a priority, which is really um, going to revolutionize how we think about cyber defense. So. Already today, the cyber landscape is very challenging. We see like 38% of growth year on year in cyber attacks. We also see in the context of the war in Ukraine, uh, we published a study just to look at what happened in the first year of the war, and we have seen a 300% increase of attacks and cyber attacks on NATO countries, not even just on Ukraine, which is a 250% increase. So the, the, the geopolitical context, how it translates into the cyber environment, uh, um, particularly relevant for the Central European region in the current context, AI gonna help us deal with this. Uh, AI gonna help us manage the complexity, it already does, uh, but AI also gonna uh, democratize access to cyber defense tools. For example, one of our cloud tools, which we call SecLM, allows you to um, talk to the computer. You don't need to talk in code. You can have a conversation talking about you know, your cybersecurity strategy, for example. So huge amount of opportunities in, in of, of AI in general. And I think the Central European region is in the Free Sea region in, in general is very, very well placed. Thank you, Rita. This sounds great. And let me express my deepest gratitude to you and Google for standing by this region through thick and thin. You've been one of the first and major investors in our region, and you've been committed to Ukraine from the day Russia began its aggression. Now, Martin, as chief futurist, I believe you're an expert in future and predicting the future. <laughs> so give us your hint of how the future of this digital region will look like in a couple of years' time. Will it be powered by AI? Yes, and uh, one caveat there, or disclaimer, I do not predict the future. So, so that's, uh, that's, I leave that for we won't invite you other again. professions. Um, yeah. <laughs> but uh, there is an, um, a fantastic outlook here. Yes, there will be a lot of AI driven a little bit to what you said. AI is an enabler. It's j just a me mechanical tool there. Uh, but what, what's, what we have in Europe, uh, looking at, say, between China and the US, to make it simple, um, is a form of stability that we look for. It's not always advantageous for us. We take it too easy, don't rock the boat, and so on. Let's see how it happens. I spent 27 years in Sweden, okay? Um, and I'm a Polish guy. And Sweden is a little bit the consensus country, the social democracy. However, looking, for example, at Estonia with uh, e-residency, um, I look forward to a digital citizenship that is global and coming out of Europe as a platform. Uh, together with enormous amount of large language models uh, conveying on, on a platform that could be, I don't know, call it Spotify for LLMs, um, and connecting all these uh, new companies coming up to serve citizens. Because with all the AI acts coming out, all the warnings, this could go bad, we talked about it a little bit before, I think we need to capture opportunities. And the only way to do it is through public consensus that this might be good. And the public consensus won't come from very rich companies uh, coming in and saying, this is how we do it, we do business AI. That's a given, people expect that. But it comes from citizens understanding that this is for me. I am in charge, I'm the author, the AI augments me, makes me, uh, amplifies what I can do as a citizen in this country, in this region, and as a global citizen, I can connect. So this augmentation, the first A of the future, uh, of each one of us, a personal AI, we talked about it uh, a lot uh, during the last years, and the second A, autonomy. So not only automation of our businesses, business AI will be a very strong vertical. 
but an autonomy of networks of people and business makers, uh, startups and so on, where they can act freely but safely, securely through the new tools. You don't have to compare your bullet point list. Does it match that? Is this compliant? But this will be amplified for you so you can go to creative business rather than administrative. It's the future. So these kind of trust, truth, automation that becomes autonomy and augmentation of citizens, each one of us, might be a future to look forward to. Excellent. Thank you very much. AI at its best is something that empowers all of us. Now, Victor, as an up-and-coming tech entrepreneur, you're building the future of the region. So how can we seize the opportunities given by AI as well as other digital technologies? Yeah, I think maybe from a little bit of a different perspective, I think the, the future I see is the future where you build on our core strength, which I think uh, is relatively well known. I, you know, I would say even globally that the, the, the really core deep tech talent that we have in the region, and you know, we see something that's you know I'm a little bit biased towards, but we see this, and, and one of the reasons I think we were able to be successful was that that you know a lot of our clients look at the region and say, okay, this is a place where there's a lot of you know good minds and 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 and, and very smart people who think about uh, technology and, and software and engineering, and you know, OpenAI, like one of the co-founders is Polish. I think half of the the the, the founding engineering team is Polish as well, um, and I think you know people from the region as well. That it's 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 really a strong foundation that we can build on. But at the same time, I think we need to be really going forward and building on top of this foundation and building this, this, you know, I think we are somewhere where we built the first story of this building and we need to continue to build this building up uh, to, to for it to become a skyscraper where we have, a, you know, very good uh, uh, product talent, very good uh, sales, marketing teams and business, obviously, teams that can continue to build up the products and the, uh, the innovations that we want to see coming from the region. And I'm, I'm super excited about this. I think maybe five years ago I would not be able to say that but now I'm I'm really really uh, excited about the next couple of years in the region how uh, especially in tech especially also with this context of AI uh, what can be built and what can you know come out of this region and the next what you said 30 another 30 or 300 unicorns coming out of the region um, if I may jump on that just a second um, what you said we have engineers in the region, in Poland, in Hungary, and many other places where they're actually working on AI, AI for our cloud product, um, and other different aspects. So just second that there is enormous talent in, in, in the region, and uh, we also have partnerships with universities, etc. So just to emphasize the point there. Absolutely. Now, Victor, let's stay on the talent side for a little bit more. Now, we've been an engine of amazing talent for many, many years. But how do we make sure to retain that talent? To have you know companies like OpenAI being founded out of Poznan rather than some other place um, in the Silicon Valley. So how do we keep this talent and make sure it ignites opportunities in our region? Yeah, I mean, to be frank, I, I don't think this is the right question, honestly. I think I'm not super worried about people going somewhere you know, learning and improving and actually sometimes maybe co-founding companies outside of Poland as long as, or, or the region, as long as they you know, somehow contribute back to the to the community. And we see this happening, like one of the co-founders of uh, Snowflake, the biggest tech IPO in, in, uh, in the Valley, uh, I think, ever. Uh, he's, he's a Polish guy. He, you know, he left Poland, I think, in... Um, for <laughs> his studies, and, and now he's contributing, he's investing in the ecosystem, uh, both for as, as an angel investor, you know, investing in funds and being active in, in some organizations. So I think this, we can, we can leverage this, even though, you know, sometimes we, we think about, okay, how can we, you know, def you know, defend ourselves from people leaving? I don't think it's, this is the right question. I think the right question is, how can we, you know, empower those folks and also then help them uh, stay connected to the region and, 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 and give back whatever they've learned and whatever they've accomplished. I think that's absolutely true, and thank you for highlighting this point. Now, we can't discuss AI without mentioning the AI Act, one of the hottest topics uh, these days, um, and what it brings for companies that are very large, companies that are large, and companies that will become large. <laughs> um, how do you perceive it? Um, what do you think are the core benefits, um, and how can the region make the most of it? Rita, perhaps, let's start with you. Happy to. Um, I think our CEO was probably the first who came up publicly saying AI is too important not to regulate. 
but also too important not to regulate well. Um, so we have been supportive of the EU AI Act and as it was published, it follows a risk-based approach, uh, focuses on the end use cases, which we believe is the right way approach. I mean, regulating AI is, is like regulating mathematics, so it's very broad, it's everywhere. Uh, but um, identifying use cases which are potentially high risk um, is something that we are supporting. Um, the negotiations are still ongoing, and we understand there was a political agreement in December. I don't have insight of what the details are of those uh, agreements. I believe we're still waiting for, for the text, uh, potentially. And with any legislation, the, the devil is in the details, so we continue to, to follow that very closely. But there's also international um, development in this area. For example, the G7 um, just published um, through the Hiroshima process, uh, an international code of conduct for AI. Uh, we have been among the first ones to say we're going to support that code. I understand the European Commission was very, very involved in negotiating um, that code, so it's also going to be interesting of what's going to be the interplay between the European rules and the international rules. Um, there are also other developments in the UN, etc. So there's a, there's a lot of um, movement in this space. We believe this is going to be important to put down rules for everybody. Um, but we also believe it's going to be important to get the details right. Absolutely. I think that's a great point. Martin, yes, any uh, thoughts on this? Yeah, uh, the risk-based approach, it comes again. I'm, uh, you know, looking at the future, you need to be positive. Um, there is no other way to make progress. Uh, as I said actually here yesterday, we didn't go to the moon by being like, nah, it maybe happens. We, d we went there because we were naively positive about it in this decade, you remember. I think maybe this is the new moonshot or slingshot or whatever you want to call it. Um, we need to be extremely positive and our citizens in, in the region needs to know that. And I think they will know how we implement the AI Act to the citizens by effect. So it's not only transparency in data and so on and protection from that data usage, it's transparency in actions. What do we want to do? Where do we invest our money as governments, organizations, and businesses uh, to, to leverage your life? Um, I could imagine, again, from a futurist perspective, a uh, life and workflow app for each citizen that is absolutely protected on the device, on the edge AI, that might uh, appear very soon, very effectively on some devices, where we can have vocational training, when we can have at-work training that is immediately enabling you to do something else in a protected way. And coming to talent there, that develops talent and usage of these new technologies, rather than, as you said, oh, they will you know, get out of here. No, you're protected here, you can develop, you can grow as a company, as a startup, but also as a big business with many citizens within your company that are enabled uh, to do that in a transparent way. So extreme positive uh, outlook with a social growth uh, as a major uh, effect of this AI act then people might think, no, the act is not here to police uh, us. It's here to grow the social enablement of technology, digital growth uh, in Europe. Thank you so much. I must say that it feels incredibly refreshing to be finally at a panel where people talk positively about AI <laughs> and that it won't bring the end of the world. I'm not um, saying that there are dangers. Uh, I'm just saying that the Europe's uh, stable culture and this region's culture of grabbing opportunities Exactly. It combined this those, our and we have a bomb. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, Victor, um, what does the AI Act mean for startups and smaller companies? Did we get the balance between innovation and regulation right? Well, I mean, it's, it's really hard to judge at this stage. I think f for, for smaller companies, definitely. I mean, a lot of people say, you know, large corporates, they're all you know, against regulation. You know, they're, they're trying to, you know, weasel their way around. And I, I don't think that's, that's really the, the right approach. I think it's really the, the, the smaller players who are the most concerned about over-regulating the industry because the large players, and we've seen this, you know, in privacy in EU, like large players are able to navigate. They have legal teams, they have, you know, they have resources to be able to find the best way for them to move forward. And, and then the smaller players are, are not really in a position to do that. So, so the, the, the way to um, kind of kill innovation is to definitely to over-regulate. I think what we should be focusing on really is the, is the really core 
uh, kind of uh, use cases where we definitely see risks. You know, with so definitely misinformation. You know, cyber is another area where we see you know AI being a, a possible huge threat to to society, and that's where we should probably uh, have some kind of intervention. But you know, I would as you know, coming from you know, hopefully speaking a little bit for for the for the smaller uh, innovators, I think we need as much space to be able to innovate as possible and, and as, as safe for for the society. Um, but we'll we'll see how you know this particular act will play out. But that's kind of a I think what what a lot of small players are thinking. Now, one of the core mechanisms for spurring innovation within the AI um, is supposed to be the sandbox system instituted by the AI Act, which means that innovators will be able to play with high-risk AI systems and develop them within, I would say, a safe environment, so to speak. Now, um, can our region become a leader in the sandboxes? Can we you know, be the first ones or the most proactive ones in establishing this kind of sandboxes so that we take the initiative when it comes to developing important but higher risk AI applications? Well, I think, I think yes, but, or yes, and. Uh, I think if you think, as also like in the context of the region, I think the hacker culture that we have, and, and you, you've mentioned Estonia, you've mentioned, you know, obviously for sure Poland, from my experience, hackers are excited about doing things on the edge of whatever, like law, you know, appropriateness, or, or you know, things that, that are, you know, somewhere there in the in the kind of gray zone. So I think, and a lot of innovation actually happens there. And we have to, op again, like, you have to be careful, you know, the whole conversation about, you know, f Facebook talking about, you know, move fast and break things, you know, now they're thinking maybe that's, you know, that's not exactly what should be doing now at this stage. But like very early on, this kind of a mindset of hacking or maybe being a little bit uh, on the edge of of, of um, innovation, I think it's it's something that we need to be careful not to lose by sandboxing and and kind of uh, sterilizing everything. So I would say yes, but but with this kind of a uh, and or but at the end. Mm -hmm. I think that's an excellent point. Yeah, and, and, and I would like to add to that. That is exactly what I'm thinking. Sandboxing doesn't mean. Um, to, to check one effect of one feature of what you're doing and see how that pushes the legislation. For example, that will be a nice one. I think, uh, being Europe, we should connect all these e-residents, if you wish, say a company, a startup. They have a great idea. With three other countries and 15 other startups combined their efforts in a safe, secure way, um, through this, can, what do you guys do? Do you have a description? Do I need to connect to you in the right way? What's the compliance legislation? That's not the real job. The real job is actually to connect and test it in a sandbox. And I think these sandboxes should be spread across topics, uh, features, uh, problems we need to solve, opportunities we grab, rather than uh, regions, countries, or companies themselves. We need to dissolve these boundaries to start working together in a specific programs that are maybe sanctions through the AI Act, but they are also enablers to, for sandboxes for problem solving rather than growth for specific agents, like a company, like SAP or a startup, but together with others. And this is what I mean by autonomy. You can go to business directly rather than try to figure out if that business would be safe. And that is, for me, the, the, the power of this digital idea and connection between the countries in an autonomous connection. So you don't have to think about the legislation that's embedded in how we connect, but you need to think, think about if that innovation we provide is you know, legislatively correct. And that maybe is an opportunity to sandbox around topics and opportunities. I think that's an excellent point. You can't develop sophisticated solutions in a vacuum. There needs to be a broader environment of interactions. Now, going a step back to digital skills. Now, we were talking about this region being incredibly good at creating top talent. But in the end, we need to make sure that AI is as inclusive as possible, that as many citizens as possible understand these systems mm. and are able to use them uh, to their benefit. But on the other hand, we see the European statistics that paint a very bleak picture about Central and Eastern Europe. Um, digital skills across our populations are not even close to the European average. Now, Google has been working a lot in this area, and Rita, tell us what you've been doing, and I'll ask a similar question to you guys as well. 
Yeah, and I think it's not just people, but also businesses. And I've seen statistics where in the entire uh, Europe, there's only 8% of the SMEs who are using AI today. There are only about a third of SMEs who are using cloud-based solutions today. Um, so I think there's still a way to go to help not just the, the, the big companies to kind of um, uh, accelerate their digital transformation, but also continue with what we've seen with COVID where, where more and more smaller businesses are also relying on technology. And cloud is a very interesting one uh, because that's a, a great fast way to get access to the state of the art latest and the greatest technological um, innovation. So we have multiple different programs. We're trying to help the enterprise community to gain the skills. Uh, we're hoping that many of our cloud products are going to help them also um, stay on top of the, the digital evolution. But we also have a program called Grow with Google, uh, which have um, the whole idea behind is you don't need to have five years of university. And I say it from the perspective of someone who spent many, many years in different universities around the world. But um, the idea of the Grow with Google program is you can get certifications on cybersecurity and on other uh, core skills that you need in about six months' time, and that's job ready. That's going to get you um, jobs as well. And we increasingly integrate AI, not just having a standalone AI kind of certificate, but integrating AI in the different certificates that we're providing. And we're hoping that this is going to help uh, many people around the region to get the skills that they need. Amazing. Um, now, if we go to either of you, how are you nurturing talent in-house and in your respective environments? Well, I mean, for us, this is a, the core of what we do, right? We, uh, you know, our our engineers, you know, the talent that we have, they need to be, you know, at least a step ahead um, uh, of the industry to, to know what we, you know, what what's the edge of of technology right now. Uh, but I, I really want, wanted to kind of point out that I was at the panel this morning where where one of the panelists mentioned that kind of AI. They think about AI a little bit less as electricity, as this kind of one of those new core. Uh, very basic tools that we call almost commodities in a sense, not not in a sense of like being cheap, but like in a sense that being so ubiquitous that we need to start embedding the the learning and the education around it. Maybe similar to electricity, when you know every four or five year old should probably know that you don't put uh, uh, a wire in 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 the socket. That that you have to kind of uh, you know teach folks from very long, young age like what are their dangers. You know how do you use AI. I think this is what you know, we're going to see, or hopefully going to see, on every stage of the education going forward. And this is, you know, probably large part of it is on the on the governments to to implement, but also within organizations, we we definitely need to be thinking about how every single employee, not not an engineer, not 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 always the uh, the technical folks, they they how do, do they know how to interact with AI and what it's going to mean, what are the risks, and what are the considerations to to keep in mind. I think that's a great point, and we should also think about how we can bring this kind of advanced digital skills already to our primary and secondary schools, mm -hmm. exactly as Estonia has done it beautifully many years ago. I don't know if you're aware of their incredible program called Programming Tiger that teaches kids already in preschool how to solve problems and do some very, very basic programming. And uh, this is, I think, something that can uh, inspire curiosity and later on innovation in young people's mind and it's super precious. What about you? You're and a big organization yeah. with a lot of talent. And I, I guess as, as you maybe, and I mean you're in your nature, uh, we've been looking at this for quite a while. Um, I would say a decade uh, in, in some ways. So we were talking internally at SCP uh, about the, the concept of me, my AI very early on, or my machine learning back then, my analytical tool, where I am better at doing my job uh, depending on my cognitive uh, abilities. Uh, we all prefer Excel spreadsheets compared to video stories uh, about the analytics of our financial situations. Someone is left-handed or right-handed. All those things are different for each one of us. So we try to develop our business software in such a way when it hits your your consumption, your user experience, it's yours. 
So this is where we think internally at SAP first, and then obviously out to the world, it's important, because then the workers can focus on the work. We call it the human in the center of their work, rather than in the center of our systems, which is a huge difference if you think about it. We do align with the tools we are presented with, rather than tools aligning with who they, they meet. And yesterday we talked about the 10 billion personal AI soon, in some decades. And I think that's one way to do it. And then spin off what you said, uh, there is a governmental organizational role there as well. I would like to see a public business service AI slash business. So when you start up, how do I go about it? A chat GTP for being, you know, plug and thrive rather than plug and play. Many people can plug into the business network systems and so on, and they go, what now? Will they fool us? Can we make money from this? How about a little help for that? That is safe, secure, and private, obviously, and le legislatively uh, compliant. But that kind of infrastructure of smartness, you know, the smartest app in the world is the one that makes you smarter. And we have the technology for that now. And I'm, I'm looking forward to that. I think that's, uh, that's an excellent point. And one last question before opening the floor to all of you. What would be your top recommendations or advice to the governments in the Three Seas region to hmm. make sure we continue nurturing talent, to make sure we continue attracting investments and building top-notch AI? Pita? Um, we were just talking about it walking up the stairs with Mark. The Free Seas initiative has digital as one of the core components in, in promoting connectivity, but only less than 15% of the resources are going to actually digital. I think, you know, the, the underlining infrastructure, which is, you know, connection to the internet going to remain really important, investing in that, investing in talent. Uh, making sure that people, companies, governments, governments leading the way in the adoption of some of these technologies, uh, adopt state-of-the-art technology, because the technology evolution in this space is incredibly fast. If you follow any one of our executives, every month, I would say, we come up with something new and maybe more and more frequently than that. So, so when you think about, for, and then the last bit is the regulatory environment, the competitiveness is not just about if the latest technology is available, but when it is available. If you need to have like big compliance effort to evaluate before you're launching products in, in Europe, for example, that um, you know, delay in availability can have uh, an, an impact in the overall competitiveness of the region. So I, I think, and then you asked the sandbox question before, I think another important aspect is innovation happens around the world. Um, so how do you create a sandbox for the region in a sense where you don't need to supervise every single innovation, but kind of be a trusted partner where companies can go to you with questions and have a, a constant dialogue with the regulators. We have a lot of ongoing constructive uh, relationship with regulators around Europe. But if, the, if, if, for example, something like the sandbox become you have to innovate through a supervised system, there's no resources on the planet from the regulatory side which can supervise everything, while in the meantime, Europe com competes on the global stage to attract the innovation, to attract the latest product developments, the rollouts, et cetera. So I think a holistic approach around you know, infrastructure, skills, state-of-the-art technology, encouraging the uptake of that, as well as thinking about the regulatory environment that really fosters competitiveness will be important. Mm. I think, Rita, this is a great point that the EU seems to forget occasionally. We uh, compete in a global race where we are not the leader. So um, this is important to note. Victor, what would be your top advice to the new Polish government or any government in the region? I think I think look, especially uh, from the when SMB's you think about those those major you know uh, long term issues, I think everything always comes down to education, and we touched on this a little bit. But I would add to it maybe a little bit on top of that that once you know you you are able to educate folks, you then need to bring them in and get you know get more young people in positions of power. I think this is one of the things that, you know, both US, but also Europe, Poland specifically, and the region I would imagine as well, has an issue with. Like a lot of folks in the positions of power are people who, by design, are not even able to understand the technology as, as the young people are today. And I think we need more of the young people in the positions of power, you know, in different levels of government, 
making decisions and driving the, 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 some of those things that they've learned through this education system that I think, you know, especially in, in you know, there, there are certain, you know, statistics that, that you've mentioned that are still, you know, worrying, but I think the education system is not that bad. And I think we can bring in some of those folks who are now quite well educated, you know, some of them, like, as you mentioned, they leave the country. Can we give them an opportunity to, to, you know, join maybe on the political side, on the government side, and actually lead the changes uh, from what they've learned in the, in the educational system? Excellent. We definitely need more young people in the positions of power. So which one of you two will become the next digital yeah, we, minister? We can, it's a, it's a co-chair there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Completely. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Yes, uh, uh, I'd like to add to that. Um, we've been looking at technology for so, so many years, developing s faster exponentially. Um, and my passion is the, the human ingenuity in it. Uh, uh, the vision is that the human ingenuity and the machine intelligence in a symbiosis. It's not a transactional relationship. It's symbiotic, emotionally empathic uh, relationship. This is for me. I feel good with this. Uh, so that's the general direction. And then we can translate that to, for example, governmental and organizational support for diversity of tools. Um, in Europe, we have so many languages, so many different cultures. I mean, we have them everywhere. But I would like to see LLMs supported uh, to grow through the startup community by government investments to be diverse, very vertical, very slim LLMs, where the small and medium businesses can manage their special one-off kind of manufacturing with an LLM that doesn't exist specially for them. So they need to adapt to the tools rather than find a diverse tools for them. Second point on that diversity and the human ingenuity in the center of AI would be, let's pick women. Uh, we have 50% of the workforce that is absolutely not uh, uh, enabled to, to perform to full capabilities. Uh, and I think Europe could lead that change. The change is coming, but it's not coming fast enough. Um, we don't have the shortage of talent. No, we have shortage of women inclusion in the talent pool. And that needs to change. AI can help, governments can help. And when it comes to messaging about what I said, be positive, governments, please. Say, we are here for you. I think the future is bright, and here's your life and work, Citizen AI, they will help you. You find a job, kindergarten or whatever, what, what do you call it uh, in English? Uh, school for your children and so on. Easier, you're moving to a new town. It's a flow of things rather than you being dumped in a situation and what now? There is help to get. So direct help in your life so you can be that human in the center of your life and work with your ingenuity amplified by the AIs that government sponsors and supports with large investments. Europe could be a leader in the human growth I think this was a perfect inauguration speech of the new European Commission president. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. Now, let me open the floor for your questions. I'm sure this excellent discussion sparked a lot of curiosity among you. So please raise your hand, introduce yourself, and uh, ask a question. Not all of you at the same time, please. <laughs> one by one. I see the second row being very, uh -huh, Ian. Hi, I'm Ian Brzezinski, Senior Fellow at the Atlantic Council. How do you see AI affecting positively or, or negatively, disruptively, or however, the upcoming elections in 2024, particularly in Europe? Great question. Thank you, Ian. I guess I'm going to take that one. Um, you're right. This year is a phenomenal election year. I think we have 70 or 80 elections around the world, and we are very, very focused on a few things. One is uh, a lot of people using our services to get information on where to vote, how to vote, like practical information which really helps people to participate. Second, as you pointed out, there are a lot of concerns around disinformation, misinformation, which for years and years Google have been very focused on and we're monitoring really closely of what the latest um, technology means and how we can um, get ahead of it. And I talked about cybersecurity at the very beginning. <laughs> for years now, we have seen, um, you know, politicians running for election being specifically targeted uh, for all sorts of reasons. So we have a special program, um, uh, which is an advanced security protection that is, is really designed for individuals who have uh, a heightened security need. So a combination of helping 
people uh, get the information they need to participate because ultimately that's the <laughs> that's the biggest point of all these elections, making sure that we're very focused on the disinformation, misinformation side and the cybersecurity side is how we're approaching it. Excellent. Anyone else on this topic? Yeah, we were joking about it in, in the team. When will we see, you know, made in Germany, made in Korea and all that? When, when will we see a decent, trustful stamp says made in AI? Um, with, with all the wonderful things that comes with it. And I, I would like to see that transparency. It's, it's obviously a hard nut to crack, but I think being that kind of as honest as we can be about the content, the messages we have uh, out there, at least in Europe, at least in these confined areas, because globally that it's a nightmare to, to manage, or at least in your country, in your region, when you elect, try to be very careful that this, this messaging is supported by AI in some way. And here's three or 17 ways you can check the alternatives to that messaging. Here's a message by a human, and that human has these and these biases and so on. I would like to have a little ticker on every TV channel out there saying, yeah, this is probably 69% right. Uh, that would be my dream of the future. Maybe not for this year's election, which was your question, but the future elections to come. Maybe briefly, I mean, I cautiously optimistic. I think, you know, judging from the last election in Poland and without going into politics, I think the, the huge turnout that we had, uh, like uh, unprecedented, the biggest turnout, the biggest uh, um, since, since, the, since, since, since the communist time, kind of shows how much technology can actually do, uh, create a positive outcome. Um, and I think people are excited about it. And I think we, we, we were fairly um, well protected somehow uh, from, from, from the misinformation that, that, that happened throughout the, the election time. So I'm, you know, based on this kind of small, fairly recent example, I'm actually quite optimistic, but obviously, you know, there's a lot of risks like we, like we discussed. Mm. May I add one more thing there? Uh, dear politicians, uh, you will be in the center of this stage. Um, please educate yourself. I, who mentioned that before? It's your job. Um, don't go on stage and make shit up. Um, bring an expert. Bring a scientist. Bring a philosopher. Bring a behavior and social scientist on that stage that you otherwise do not combine your efforts to, to win with. But do that. And don't politicize their uh, opinions. Make them a platform for your opinions so people can judge themselves. It's time for politicians to switch to become philosophers, designers of the future, and actually uh, active participators to connect the community of experts rather than uh, make your own expertise up and, and try to message it out to the world. I guess you encapsulated the difference between a politician and a statesman Maybe. in a digital <laughs> era very, very well. Now, the second role. The floor is yours. Oh, yeah. Can you please introduce yourself first? Right there. Thank you. I'm Monika Rajska from Colliers. Um, I heard last week on the panel discussion that actually um, we, as you mentioned in Confume, we have a very great and fantastic um, ta talent pool. But also what I heard that, uh, you know, the, uh, the increasing of the salaries and also compensations uh, in the region, this actually causes that we are not more attractive for um, some foreign investors. And uh, also what I heard that our national companies like you know, Polish, Romanian and Czech, they are actually are not, you know, they are far away with the implement of the digital transformations. Which is mean that in the long, long term, we are going as a region somehow losing um, opportunities for the new investment. So I would like to hear from your side, what is the reason that uh, actually national companies are not such a quick, you know, with the, with the transformation, digitalization, but as well, how we can be more attractive, you know, for the potential investors. I think that's an excellent question, especially in the light of tens of billions of dollars in subsidies that are given out to foreign investors by countries like Germany and other European counterparts. So how do we remain competitive and how can we supercharge the digital transition of our national champions? Very briefly. I can go, uh, but that might be from my perspective, my, my, my job as a futurist or strategic foresight uh, perspective, I think many of the big players, incumbents, including SAP, but everybody else as well, um, we are investing heavily in strategic foresight, long-term innovation thinking, uh, futurism, if you wish, because that helps us to play the roadmap out to the uncertain areas. And if we do and get comfortable with the questions that you just asked, hey, how, what is happening? 
we will not default back on the next three quarters and reacting to any AI act or any move by open AIs out there in the world, whoever they might come from. Um, we will be our own uh, um, innovation pool of ideas because we are confident in the foresight we have. We do not have foresight. Look at the Middle East. A uh, very difficult political system for us to, uh, Europeans to understand, some of us, but a very lucrative and very fast-moving innovation ecosystem. There's a lot to learn from that, how we can move faster if you have the 10, the 20, the 30 years outlook that, for example, the Asian uh, community have, also with a different business philosophy, if I may suggest, and also political philosophy. If we can learn a little bit from that, we will be more comfortable in having the difficult long-term discussions to translate to our tactical moves in the next three months. Today, we focus only on the latter. I think that's a great point. I think. Oftentimes I hear from politicians in the region, we want to be as good as Germany. I would like to hear them say, we want to be the best. Mm -hmm. And this is, I would say, sometimes the lack of ambition that we need to bridge. Victor, I just, please. I, I, whenever I hear about those statistics and I, and I hear about them a lot, I feel a little bit uneasy because for me there's a huge contrast you know, coming from this data compared to what I experience as, as, a, as a citizen living in Poland specifically, where I feel like, you know, the digitalization of both the government, public, you know, the basic you know, consumer experiences, you know, things like renting a car, you know, getting groceries, all this stuff is, you know, coming here even to Switzerland, I feel like we're living the future a little bit. And then it comes to this, you know, the, the, the companies in Poland not being as, or the, in the region not being as uh, digitalized. I, I see this contrast and I don't know exactly wh wh where is it coming from. My kind of, uh, you know, hypothesis there is maybe there is a, con con a little bit of a um, challenge where we think about companies who are very successful locally, but they're not able to, to go into more of a regional, global, context and, and, and be successful there. Because I whenever I see companies, especially, you know, there's there's a bunch of examples, again, in Poland, like there's Impost, there's a bunch of companies who are, I think, you know, leading the way globally in the in the experience of for the consumer, but they're, most of them are still very much uh, on the local market. Uh, so maybe that's where the statistics are kind of uh, going different directions, but I'm, I'm actually more optimistic about where we are and, and how can we build on that and, and kind of create kind of global champions, uh, not only local. That sounds great. Rita, maybe any maybe thoughts on this maybe one? Maybe just to zoom out um, at a European level, um, at the in, in, in the last quarter of uh, last year, there were a bunch of reports, for example, from Business Europe that compared uh, foreign direct investments in Europe and US and said there are two-thirds decrease of foreign direct investments in Europe, what two-thirds increase in the United States. Um, there were others, I think it was the Nordic countries who sent the letter raising concerns about productivity <laughs> of companies being 40% lower in Europe than comparing it to American based in Washington DC. So I'm, 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 I'm following closely the, the transatlantic dy dynamics. So I think if the overall competitiveness of Europe um, uh, is uh, not as dynamic as we would like it to be, it inevitably has an impact on, on this region as well. Great point, thank you, Rita. We have time for one quick question. Okay. Um, yes, please. Uh, great panel, thanks so much, everyone. Um, Mateusz Leta Cyriankiewicz, um, uh, Future Works. Um, this will be a futurist question. How far are we from someone with a group or a little swarm of uh, agents out competing regular kind of, let's call them legacy business structures. So, sorry, can you repeat the question? How far are we from, uh, from someone using a bunch of agents, self-guided agents, uh, uh, from out competing regular uh, businesses? Uh, so so uh, if, if I understand your maybe worry uh, correctly, we could have AI bots out competing people and people organizations in businesses, for example, by doing better business than they can do. Okay, for me, that's the human ingenuity and the uh, uh, machine intelligence in symbiosis. And I think Europe could be the cradle for that. Because if you look at, at, at US that moving so fast, back to your question and, and the answer you gave there, the very nice plane to, to, to discuss on, and we're looking at the Asian uh, opportunistic drive forward, but with the long time, like we have a philosophy forward, but we act now for, for the money. 
Europe could act long term, but translated to immediate safety in the citizens, uh, digital citizenship and, uh, and, and security and safety there. I think um, combining those powers is important now. Because if we don't do it now, five years from now, the danger you described might become truth. Um, I think giving people that uh, ability to check what it, what, who they are interacting with is uh, important. And that's what I call autonomy. Automation, how wonderful ever it is, uh, speaking from SAP side, uh, is not always uh, the end of your business. Um, business is made by people. Uh, none business have ever been made by a transaction or a, an algorithm, in a sense. Business is made by, should we go into a, a mutual trust with our, our own money together? Yes, then press the button. And to augment people to how we interact with who are you, who am I, how many bots will you use, how transparently can I look into your algorithms or my algorithm into yours, and then we take a decision, and reserving that decision to humans, executive humans, so they can be creative about those decisions, discuss them with subjective human opinions, rather than automated answers from chat GTP, will be the, the play field for, for that kind of symbiosis. So I'm, I am very optimistic because we're in the beginning, but it might be a tipping point somewhere, and it's closer than we think. So I give it years to be solved, and I think Europe is the place to solve it. I, Amazing. I, Rita, I would just yes. want to second that. I think the, the productivity gain of many of these tools are enormous. So for companies, we, we call internally dog fooding as we, we testing the technology before we, we um, making it available to our customers and the rest of the world. Um, so we've been using for a while, like, write me my first draft of the email. And, you know, we all get in the hundreds of the emails every, every day. And, you know, just the simple fact that the computer generates the first draft that you can just quickly edit, it makes you faster in uh, the mundane uh, type of tasks. Or translate me this document and then I can read it through instead of, like, you know, going through the motion of translating it for myself. So for... For companies who are using these tools, and this is our objective as Google, to use AI to help people um, you know, save time to do what you know, is really strategic or spend your time on, on what's, what's really the most exciting part probably of your job as opposed to you know, some of the mundane tasks that we can, we can really kind of speed up and, and, and offload. So for those companies and individuals who will adapt to this, like with any kind of technology, will obviously going to be a big gain, while for those who are um, much slower in, in the adoption, I mean, they're, they're, they're probably going to start to become a gap. Mm. Maybe Victor. small, small like small like uh, philosophical spin on this. I think this scenario that you're just describing, I can see it happening in in value extraction. So things like you know high intensity trading, you know things where you can try to you know find a way to extract value from something that was already created. But I think it's super hard to find examples of those kind of uh, uh, situations happening where you kind of try to create value. And I think this is might be a big distinction of you know where humans are involved. I think that there's there's bigger potential for value creation. I think the automation obviously is sometimes can be very good at, at extracting value. Now, uh, let's finish this panel with me asking you to give a very short piece of advice to the young people of the Three Seas region in a sentence or two. I guess uh, as a Hungarian origin who lived around the world and now in the United States, I think there's there's so many opportunities out there. Be excited, learn how this works. There's so many tools to learn. Be curious, um, and I think the world is yours. Amazing. Victor? Yeah. Maybe slightly similar and, and also building on what we've said before. I think my, maybe the advice is actually do leave. Go somewhere, you know, spend some time uh, outside of the region and learn and come back, maybe, uh, and then be productive and, 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 and be helpful to the community, but also, you know, expand for yourself. Awesome. Um, Martin? Two Europeans, Marie Curie and Albert Einstein, were in their early 20s when they made their breakthroughs. So, yeah, it's possible. Uh, don't take authority for granted. 
uh, respect authority in a certain way, but you are the author uh, of your own future. Uh, many businesses forget that sometimes. They are judged by the past and they stuck in the past. You are the young people that will be the next Marie Curie's with two Nobel Prizes, by the way. Um, you have these opportunities to move around in a larger scale today than before. Take them. You are the author. Uh, we are not anymore. We are here to manage your authorship. Amazing. Thank you so much to the wonderful panelists. Thank you so much to the great audience. What can I say? Let's continue to educate, innovate, create, and thrive, and let's stay positive about AI and everything else. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.
Uh, greetings, one and all. Uh, just looking at this full audience, sold out house, and wondering how we're going to get everybody in with the heads of state tomorrow, but, uh, but we're looking forward to, to, to having them. Uh, I'm Fred Kemp. I'm uh, President and CEO of the Atlantic Council, and welcome to 3C's hub here in Davos. Um, uh, we are technically in what uh, in Washington is called the think tank sector, and I think we're uh, very strong in that sector, but I hate the term think tank. Uh, uh, and I think in this context of three C's, it's worth saying this, because uh, we're an action tank, we're a do tank. Thinking is a nice first step, but then after that you have to get deals done, you have to get work done, you have to, you have to complete Europe. And that's what the three C's is about. Uh, so on behalf of the Atlantic Council and Poland's Development Bank, BGK, <coughs> thank you for joining us at 3C's Hub for this panel discussion on building the 3C's as a partner for Ukraine's European future. Uh, I not only want to thank our partners at BJK, particularly Beata and Pavel, but also uh, the leaders of the Atlantic Council was pu who put this together. So Ian Brzezinski at the top of the list, Denise Forstruber, Emma Nix, and Lisa Hamel. So thank you so much for everything you've done to make this uh, beautiful house possible. And you're going to sit in a lot of rooms where you're not going to see a view like this. Um, so look out the window here because there's a lot of downstairs rooms and th that will be used during the, your time in, in Davos. Um, 
Uh, the Three C's Initiative, after which this house is named, was launched in 2016 to accelerate the development of cross-border infrastructure in the region situated between the Baltic, Black, and Adriatic Seas. Uh, the intention was to build a north-south corridor for energy, for digital, for transportation, and anybody who has any question about the flaws and the demerits of the east-west corridor just has to think about February of 2022 and then what happened with Western Europe and its energy deliveries thereafter to know um, that it was a visionary uh, concept. Uh, the Atlantic Council first wrote about it uh, in 2014, calling it a north-south corridor and calling the paper Completing Europe. Uh, <coughs> The initiative ex consists of 13 EU member states, which arguably con constitute the most economically dynamic region in Europe. Together, they are leveraging uh, the power of cross-border energy, transport, and digital links to drive economic growth, strengthen economic resilience, and even reinforce military security. This is an economic project, but it is of, uh, of uh, considerable geopolitical significance. Cross-border infrastructure is the underpinning of a single European market and the fulfillment of the vision of an undivided Europe, what President, H, uh, President George H.W. Bush called a completing uh, Europe whole and free. The initiative launched in 2016 has momentum. It features a unique investment fund to catalyze infrastructure projects. Uh, just this last fall, the U.S. government announced it's supporting the fund with a $300 million investment facility. And also last fall, Greece, one of Europe's most vibrant economies, uh, joined the initiative. The role of three C's in Europe is extremely relevant to the most important subject um, and one of the most urgent subject of any of the convenings here in Davos, uh, Davos and that's Ukraine's um, <coughs> reconstruction and integration into a wider Europe after it prevails and wins in, its, uh, in, it, in the unprovoked, illegal, illegitimate war uh, waged by Russia on Ukraine. The more tightly embedded the Three Seas region is within a wider Europe, the more quickly and more resiliently can Ukraine be integrated into Europe. We often talk about doing something for Ukraine, trying to uh, help Ukraine survive. We're doing something for ourselves, and Ukraine is doing it for us. And I think we have to keep reminding ourselves of that, because for Ukraine not to prevail, for Ukraine not to come into Europe, uh, uh, really has generational consequences that we don't want to consider. As a region that neighbors Ukraine, which, by the way, is a partner member of uh, the initiative, the Three Seas Initiative, Three Seas countries bring to the table not only geographic connectivity, but also a shared history of repression and occupation uh, from the Soviet era. Many of their lessons learned, both the successes and the mistakes, from their integration into the EU and remarkable economic development are applicable and will be applicable to Ukraine. And it is an understatement to say that many of the three C states stand among the staunchest supporters of Ukraine's courageous effort to defeat Russia's brutal invasion. The Three Seas Initiative is all about completing a vision of Europe undivided, free, and secure. Without Ukraine fully integrated, Europe cannot be undivided, free, nor secure. To discuss how the Three Seas can contribute to and accelerate uh, Ukraine's European future, we have an important uh, and exciting discussion ahead of us. Um, uh, it will be led by Ambassador John Herbst. Uh, he's the senior director of the Eurasia Center. Um, a, a former U.S. ambassador to Ukraine, and he leads our work uh, on Ukraine across the Atlantic Council. Our panel speakers are a robust group. Former Estonian President Kersi Kalulade, she now leads the Kersi Kalulade uh, Foundation, and as president hosted a groundbreaking 3C Summit and Business Forum. She's also a member of the Atlantic Council's International Advisory Board. Uh, Ukraine Deputy Minister of e Economy and Development, Taras Kachka, Taras helped lead Kiev's negotiation that led to the EU-Ukraine Association Agreement and is Ukraine's trade representative. And then Ms. Lena Kojarny is the founding partner and chief executive officer at Horizon Capital. Uh, Horizon is the leading private equity firm in Ukraine with $1.5 in assets under management. Over the last five years, Horizon, it says in my notes, 
uh, raised some 750 million investments in Ukraine. Lena just corrected this. It's actually 785 million <laughs> and counting. Uh, and I hope she'll talk to, to a little bit about some of the, uh, I mean, consider that amount of investment in this kind of period of time. It says a lot about uh, the faith uh, of, in Ukraine and Ukrainians. And then Dr. Mark uh, Tomchuk, uh, member of the management board, Polish Development Bank, BGK. Mark brings two decades of experience at, and top positions in Poland's state-owned and private banking sectors, uh, and he'll have a lot of fascinating inputs as well. Uh, before um, uh, I turn over to John Herbst, let me just tell you that the programming will be shared on social media with the hashtag 3Cs Hub, so hashtag 3Cs Hub. Um, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and with that, we'll get started. This is on the record. Uh, and please uh, tell everybody you meet about the Three Seas House, the uh, Three Seas Hub, and about uh, Ukraine's relationship within it. John, over to you. I was supposed to introduce the speakers, but Fred's done that, so thank you, Fred. And therefore, we don't need to delay the conversation. Uh, all right. Um, President Calulate will be joining us in a little bit. I had hoped to start with the geopolitics of this, but I'll leave that for her arrival. So let, let's talk, let's go directly to the geoeconomics of this organization and Ukraine's relationship with it. So, uh, uh, <clears throat> let me see my notes here. Minister Tkachka, uh, what is the importance for Ukraine of the Three Seas Initiative? And what would membership for Ukraine in the Three Seas Initiative mean? Yeah, so uh, I, th I think that that we, we need we need to start uh, f like the in from there is a in perspective of the initiative and there is a perspective of reality. So that because I think that indeed uh, the initiative at the beginning was uh, rather oriented of North South corridor and uh, and mostly for like EU framework of, of financing like the. F uh, um, the cohesion funds and other infrastructural funds that can be used in order to promote this infrastructure, and we we aspired from the very f uh, from the very beginning. But the, the difference in status of the of other members of this initiative and Ukraine was actually the key obstacle for better joining. So, but and it seems that free C free C's initiative now uh, get new meaning for for Ukraine and to itself as well. Because of because of war, first of all, and I think that uh, uh, the front line we have the actual military, so war front line in, in Ukraine, and also this ge geopolitic front line with Belarus and Russia to to, to the north. Uh, I think it creates um, it creates new understanding of, of infrastructure in general, and I think that it's it's not an easy uh, task of not only for Ukraine for for military things, but also from economic point of view because now we have some very hot debates and we, and protests in, in Pol Ukrainian Polish borders, and it is as well has this. Uh, let's say, geographic direction, yes, because of a lot of Polish uh, transport companies lost an opportunity of being transitors or deliverers to Russia or to Belarus, like in Ukraine as well, because we treated our, ourselves as a West-East uh, uh, transit country, but now we are not transit country, so we are like dead-end country for, for, for Eastern direction. So, and that's why, but at the same time, what we see is a new understanding of regional trade, regional trade routes. Uh, in 2022, it was an emergency situation uh, and emergency support from our neighbors on, on solidarity lanes, on uh, market access, etc. But what we see now is that 
behind these emergency developments on trade, uh, it appeared the new meaning of trade in the region. So now we see that in the south, so Romania investing in infrastructure for Ukrainian products going to third states, Bulgaria, Greece, uh, we discussed with, it with Croatia, and of course Poland as well as a na our na natural partner on, on trades to, to Baltics. So it means that war has changed a lot. We still have a lot of emergency uh, requests to, to our partners, but within it, we already see this, this seed of new understanding of trade routes already growing up and in, in, into infrastructural initiatives. So that's why I think that now Free Seas has this natural, um, natural foundation, not only artificial design as, a, as an initiative to improve in, in, in infrastructure. So this is what Ukraine can bring to, to, to this initiative, and this is what we see in this initiative. We see our future, and we see that the regional trade is changing, and it brings a lot of meaning to Free Seas initiative as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Minister. Um, Ms. Kazarni, you've been one of the most active investors in Ukraine over the last 30 years and elsewhere in Eastern Europe as well. What opportunities do you see for Ukraine um, as being part of the 3Cs initiative, for 3Cs initiative members of having Ukraine in, as we all talk about and plan for Ukraine's reconstruction after Moscow departs Ukraine? Um, thank you very much, Ambassador Herbst, and, and thank you to everyone at 3Cs Initiative. Thank you to BGK for the invitation and Atlanta Council. And, you know, I think context is everything. And, I, and for us, you know, we started as a U.S. enterprise fund, as a U.S. government fund that was mm -hmm. designed one of 10 uh, funds that received $2 billion, in our case, $150 million focused on Ukraine and Moldova. Ambassador Herbst is on the board of Western Ness, and I'm an executive vice president. Um, but we, we started from that context, and from that we, we created Horizon Capital. And mm -hmm. in doing so, that $150 million has catalyzed $2.4 billion into the country. And from our, where we sit, where we sit in Ukraine is looking beyond the media perception, beyond what is being reported. We are there on the ground and seeing that our company, our funds, the 26,000 individuals working in the companies that we back, that they are resilient, that they are uh, pushing forward the economy, they are paying taxes, 60% of Ukraine's budget comes from um, private sector paying taxes, and that they're continuing to invest. Um, you know, f I'll, I'm gonna just go on record and say this very boldly, that Ukraine and Moldova both must be part of 3C's initiative. It's not enough that they're a partner, they need to be invited as a participating state. This brings more to 3C's initiative, I would argue, than ultimately for Ukraine. Ukraine will persevere. Ukraine will emerge victorious. Um, folks were already planning for the reconstruction after World War II two years in advance. Folks are already planning for this. Folks are already looking at bankable projects. We just came from Ukraine House where Nice to see you, <laughs> Rear Admiral Michael Hewitt, who, who we had a great panel about Ukraine's significance, strategic importance, about the fact that there's four to twelve trillion dollars worth of rare earth minerals um, under Ukraine's black soil. It's not just the fact that Ukraine feeds 400 million people. Ukraine is on the forefront when it comes to rare earth minerals. Ukraine is EU's green energy partner, and I would argue that three C's already in advance of victory, inviting Ukraine, and I would say Moldova as well, why not, both are on the track to EU, is a bold step that will ultimately also ensure that 3C's initiative has a real seat at the reconstruction table. And I would make that argument very strongly, I hope, John, that I have, um, because you asked me about sectors. There's so many <laughs> sectors, I mean, I, I'm, I'm chair of AmCham board, and the companies, the 600 companies who have invested $50 billion in the country, we just did a survey, wartime survey, December 2023. 85% have increased their revenue year on year from 2022 to 2023, have met or exceeded their targets. 87% have increased, have kept their employee base or increased it. 91% 
have met their investment program or significantly exceeded it. So those on the ground, whether in energy, whether in transport, in our field, we're investing heavily. We're the largest tech investor in the country. Tech is growing. We started investing, it was 110 million industry. It's almost 8 billion now. Ukraine has so much to offer. We're capitalizing on it and we would urge the participating states of Three Seas Initiative to not hang back. You will be noticed now for stepping forward. Nobody will notice when the war is over. There's a lineup already starting. Nobody will notice. You three Cs will be on the side with everybody else who is already planning for reconstruction. But now it makes news and it's important and it must be done. Leanna, thank you very much. Mr. Tom Shook. Um, first, I should mention that I believe VGK is partly helping put this together, and we thank you for your support for this. Uh, Our pleasure. <laughs> okay. Poland has been critical as Ukraine's fought Kremlin aggression. Poland's been extremely active in the Three Seas Initiative, including pushing for a larger role for Ukraine membership, inshallah. Uh, what do you think the advantage is for Three Seas of Ukrainian membership? Uh, first of all, I fully agree that Ukraine must win this war because the consequences for the future and for the next generations will be uh, even hard to assess right now. Uh, and the role of uh, Ukraine and Moldavia in Tracy's uh, initiative uh, is, is absolutely uh, huge, in my opinion, because uh, currently we, uh, we are focused within the initiative uh, on infrastructure uh, investments, uh, energy, uh, new energy supplies, uh, and also uh, digital economy investments. Uh, all of this can be applied in, in Ukraine investment because, uh, in my opinion, it's not only rebuilding, it's the modernization and, and building from the scratch. And it's, uh, and it's a, a huge uh, chance for Ukraine and for the region to make uh, some kind of leapfrog. Uh, in terms of new technologies, uh, new um, infrastructure, modern infrastructure, because this is this is not a uh, this is th this is obvious that that this region, mm, including Ukraine, has a gap comparing to Western uh, Europe, and of course we can look at it as a gap, but we can look at uh, as an opportunity because the 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 entire Western world is also in the point of change, uh, especially in terms of energy. Um, I mean, the, the green energy, uh, the energy for the, uh, the cheap en source of energy for the, uh, for the um, uh, industry, uh, they are asking about this all the time. Uh, we're talking about the region with, uh, uh, excluding Ukraine, 120, million uh, people and when we include Ukraine and Ukraine and Moldova this is absolutely uh, uh, phenomenal potential that we that we have and last but not least this region is the fastest growing growing region within the European Union so so uh, I, I, I can say that that the, that the opportunity is absolutely uh, there we we need to focus uh, on, on developing the, the, um, uh, the region. And of course, it's not something against European Union because uh, the, the strongest uh, three seas region we're going to have, the strongest European Union will be in the future. So th this is my uh, conclusion. Thank you. Um, f a quick follow-up. Yeah. Um, and I'll also take Vanna's view on this as well. What do you see as the prospects for Ukraine actually joining three Cs? Uh, I think we have a lot of in, in, in common. Of course, uh, of course, the, nobody knows uh, how long this war will will uh, will last. But but I think uh, Ukraine Ukraine concentrate on on investment and also concentrate on defense. This is obvious. But also we need to 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 
take this subject on the table, I mean the, the defense financing, because if we're going to have uh, a stronger and, and more um, safest region, the, the situation of Ukraine, and also for investors, because investors very often asking, what is the risk? What is the risk of the region? What, what, is, what is the risk on investment in Ukraine? Mm -hmm. and, and ongoing war is not something that uh, every investor is, uh, you know, is familiar. So there's a lot of questions also regarding investors from Poland uh, to BGK. Okay, how you can mitigate or, 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 or give our, us 100% of guarantee for my business, for my investment uh, in Ukraine. Uh, and also those kind of questions are related with, with the region. So, so I think this is our common goal to, to make, a, make a, a program, make a, a significant investment. Uh, I call it investment in peace because uh, military financing is not something that we, that we used to discuss in the broader context, context but I think now is the time uh, to, to talk about this and, and of course include banking sector because uh, because right now we cannot observe many banks to, to wants to uh, wa wants to uh, finance uh, uh, military spendings or defense spendings, um, but at the same time they have many challenges regarding energy transition, regarding new technologies, that they requires uh, millions or billions of, of investments. So and and all these things happening at the same time. So I think. Um, um, this is a couple of points that, that, that we have here uh, that we can, we can think uh, together with, 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 with Ukraine. Uh, and, uh, and I think currently it's a lack of, of uh, I think, lack of this the discussion about it. Thank you. I mean, there's, there's no question that investment in Ukraine is sorely hindered by the war. And for that matter, invention, a the type of peace that's established will be essential to secure investment. But joining three C's is not the same thing as investors coming into Ukraine now. So, Lena, following this point, and we'll give the minister a chance to speak on this too. Uh, Ukraine, from your point of view, it needs to see an end to the war to join, or no? No, absolutely not. Um, Ukraine should be joining at the Lithuanian summit, at the next summit. Um, that's when Ukraine should be joining. And you mentioned about investors waiting and, you know, the risks that are involved. Okay, let, let's take our example. I mean, we started fundraising in October 2021. We took a pause until May 2022. We looked at our companies and we saw that they were growing 30% median revenue growth across the companies, despite the fact that there was a full-fledged invasion. We then start, recommenced fundraising, raised, it'll be 350 million that will hit in um, February. So we're at 328, we'll hit 350 um, by mid-February. And between us and Western NAS with 160, we've got half a billion dollars to put to work in Ukraine right now. Now that half a billion dollars multiplies into five billion. And how does it do that? Because it's, you know, when you put in the equity capital, which is the highest risk of all, when you have a quality partner like Horizon, like Western NAS, when you, when you, they commit that equity, they attract additional equity, which gives the basis to attract, you know, 50% debt against that. And all of a sudden, you know, with an equity component, you now have 100% of the project financed. Um, you know, look at the discount rate in Ukraine, it's 14%. We just had a conversation with CapEx funding, financing is three to 5% for euros in Poland. Okay, there's an arbitrage opportunity for investing in, in on the ground, in the country, using capital from you know, Western nations and putting it to work now in Ukraine. Folks can also think through uh, natural currency hedges. If you are investing and you've got expert component, it could be 100% expert, it could be 70%, 50%, you're building in a natural currency hedge, which also drives returns. So, you know, I think there's a lot of creative people out there who are looking at this gap, this gap between what is happening on the ground and the perceived risk. 
You know, the perceived risk is much greater than the actual risk. And those people who understand that um, are making a lot of money now and will make a lot of money in the future. Um, when you look at the Three Seas Initiative, I would argue that, you know, for a Ukraine infrastructure project where it's 100% Ukraine country risk, you de-risk it with a Three Seas Initiative, making it a Three Seas Initiative project. If it is a joint Poland-Ukraine project, Romania-Ukraine project that benefits um, both countries, it is very bankable, very financeable, with the higher returns that are attached to the Ukraine component, but de-risked with the cost of capital from the Polish components. So, I mean, I think, I think that there's a lot of smart minds out there, and people are starting to see this. You know, we've got, I'm a co-organizer of Ukraine House. The house is packed. There's a lot of discussions on the side about this because people understand that Russia's objectives of taking the country will not be met. And you have what happens in Ukraine, ultimately you've got a population that is fighting for the country, that is doing the heavy lifting, that needs resources to help themselves. And that, those resources include capital. And we, we need to do that. We need to do that not only for Ukraine, but for the self-interest of the investors who are contrarian and willing to do it. Very successful saleswoman. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Minister, uh, I think Leanna just laid out a, a compelling case for smart investment in Ukraine right now. <laughs> but uh, again, what does Kiev want to see happen now with the Three Seas Initiative? Then it's talking about getting the, trying to get Ukraine in at the next meeting of the, in Lithuania this year. So first of all, I think that the, you know that the, the difference between business and, and governments that business is <laughs> let's say more uh, has more acumen, you know, in terms of. <laughs> in terms of uh, attracting investments. And this is good, and this is the case for, for Ukrainian economy. So I think that that's, that's what, what, what we highlight always, that a part of uh, courage of, of the government, a part of the courage of armed forces, what was done by private business from the first day of, of aggression is still admiring us. And you know that this, uh, so 2023, our economy grew by, by 5%. Uh, so, uh, and uh, th th this is really, really incredible. and. Um, and I think that what what we want to 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 from free seas is I think that first of all is a clear message that reinforces our messages as well, and this message is is clearly important for the region as well. So that uh, you know that I think that the region so of free seas has the same. Uh, investment concern as Ukraine has. But in Ukraine, it is visible because it's like war in Ukraine and people, all the world believes that it's dangerous to invest. But there are voices saying that, yeah, you know, that's not, not, it's not only Ukraine in danger, but all the, all the region in danger. So you see that the, uh, the fa so security pressure is growing and what will happen. And our example that that economy didn't stop economy is that attractive for investment so it's you, you can grow in ukraine and you can develop a business in ukraine so it's it resonates with uh, what's going on in the region so that's why i think that this is this is the message that we need to deliver in very <coughs> precise manner as lena did it like for 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 ukraine but the same for 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 poland the same for 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 croatia and the same for romania so because you see that in terms of infrastructure, so that this modernization of infrastructure in, in the region, so in forthcoming decades, will be almost complete. If, if you talk about energy, it will be like 100% uh, replacement of existing energy. It will be a, either new generation or a modernization of existing generation, new grids, storages. Most modern, right? Most modern yeah. So that's, and it requires something really profound trust to the region. Because I think that the world has money, so that's either in IFIs, private money, it's okay. So the engineering solutions are there, but 
what will be important is an understanding of this long-term trust into in, and predictability of the region. And this region is really interesting because it's it's not only war, because beca behind the war you have ITs, you have agriculture, you have production, you have in industry, and etc. And what is important, even in defense industry, so we have a lot of co-production and to talk a project or co-production progress with neighboring states, so in the region. So, so that's why we have a lot to sell and we can sell it to the world better by, by this initiative. So that's why I think that it, it was already so that in, in summit in Bucharest was uh, really, in, in my opinion, tra was tra like transforming summit. So that there's like re-understanding of, of free seas initiative. And the next summit should be a really big pitch to the world about the region and about investments in, into infrastructure and Ukraine could be a litmus case because it's it's, uh, it's the most brightest and most maybe most radical element here. But what happens in Ukraine in terms of thinking about modernization of energy infrastructure also happens in everywhere in region, in, in Austria and in Hungary, in, in, in because they they also think about modernization of energy in different with different emotions. It's different from from Ukrainian emotions, but. What happens in Ukraine also happens in, 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 in the region. So that's why what why we believe that Ukraine helps and the region helps Ukraine and free seas could be really initiative that can sell this biggest investment, let's say, pitch in, in the region for, 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 for next generations. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Tomshire. Um, you referred to already uh, the problem of defense industry and you thought that the 3Cs initiative might be a place where this can be worked on positively. Uh, why don't you talk a little bit about the need for defense industry and the opportunities as well for it and what's necessary to make it prosper? Uh, first of all, uh, when we look at the region, currently we have, uh, we have countries that are post-Soviet post uh, countries and uh, most of them use the uh, Russian equipment maybe in, in not 100 percent but but major of this equipment comes from that uh, uh, century uh, so uh, they are still supporting the, the 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 Russian industry because of parts because of service etc second of all um, uh, the safest and the strongest regi region, uh, the Trisis region we have, the safest Western Europe and world we have, we get. Uh, because uh, when uh, we uh, go through the transition that the, the equipment and, and this challenge to finance this, this task will be completed, we're going to have a... Uh, um, 12, 13 countries that use uh, NATO standard uh, equipment, which is very important in terms of communication, in terms of cooperation. It's, uh, it's, uh, um, it's absolutely uh, crucial. Plus, of, of course, the, the new modern technologies regarding the satellites, the navigations, which is which is um, current uh, uh, most modern technologies use uh, during the war. So, um, the, and the, the, the issue, the, the challenge I see is first of all, the financing of this need because, uh, because this is the experience that we go through, I think, first time on such a scale. Uh, usually, uh, before e it, it was like, you know, G2G agreement, uh, cash payment transaction, and that's it. Right now, uh, uh, and especially countries in, in the three seas region, including uh, Ukraine and Moldavia, um, there's a lot of needs that need to be covered, I, I mean the current needs, and defense is like on top. And I, and I think we, we don't have uh, right now um, mature mechanism and structure to finance this, including development banks, because uh, it is very close to governments and, uh, and private, private sector, uh, I mean the commercial banks cannot 
handle it without development banks and cooperation with governments. So it's, it's, it is really big thing. Uh, but the time is now, I think, and uh, there's no, no doubt about it. So mm, we can observe right now that each of these countries managing, managing this kind of uh, modernization by themselves. Uh, and there is no regional, regional program that, that can support it. So maybe this is something that we, can, uh, we could talk and we, we could elaborate. Um, because in, uh, in, in the, like uh, let's say, backstage uh, discussions, this, this subject appears, and, uh, and uh, I think uh, more and more banks and, and financial institutions asking uh, how to do it uh, at the same time, how to do it uh, together with, uh, with the commercial, commercial sector, because we have some banks, uh, I mean the global banks, that have some experience in that, by, by, but they need to do this in the, uh, in the certain structure, which is not easy. Thank you. I'll make one comment, stepping outside my role as moderator, before we come to President Kaguli. Uh, I think, and I'm glad you, you talk about this, I don't have any doubt that one, to ensure Putin's defeat in Ukraine, the arms industry across the West has to greatly amp up production. But I would also add, if we were to simply amp up that production, that would be a signal to Moscow to get the hell out of Ukraine. The mere fact of doing that. Okay, now, President Kaile, we're glad you're here. We'd be going deep into economics. We need a little bit of bracing geopolitics. You've been one of the most eloquent voices on the dangers of Putin's revisionism, not just for Ukraine, where we see the horrors there, but for Europe more broadly. Uh, what, in your opinion, is the geopolitical significance of the Three Seas initiatives, Initiative, and how does that contribute, not just to Europe's prosperity, but to Europe's security? Yes, thank you indeed. There is no more urgent task than beating Putin in Ukraine, because if Putin is allowed to believe that he was fighting NATO in Ukraine and didn't exactly lose, this is really dangerous for all of us. So that said, I truly have always believed that Three Seas Initiative, uh, despite the fact that it has not quite uh, gathered so much money in its fund as we initially probably all hoped, but I think uh, the bright future is still ahead of us, did something very important for Free Seas countries. It created us as a region which saw itself as an identity. And we would very much welcome, as we did from the beginning, after all, Free Seas projects already can start in the EU country and then extend themselves to the neighboring countries. This is already in the statutes. This region had no identity as an economic cluster. It now does. And this is very important. Economic Eastern European cluster growing faster than the rest of the Europe. And if I think of the future of Ukraine, well, I do, I'm an optimist, I do believe that, uh, well, painfully slowly, but, uh, but Ukraine will win this war. Ukraine will be even more dynamic, coming from an even lower base and having even more well-educated workforce, highly motivated. In addition, Ukraine will have a situation where they will have, well, far more than ever expected of a greenfield development opportunity. I mean, there will be huge needs for reconstruction for of, uh, of simple housing for people, and I know President Zelensky already has plans on how to develop that. Of course, Ukraine has not lost its uh, capability as a big industrial power, and uh, it has a future and sees itself as the future of high-tech, also military industrial, uh, industrial producer in the future. But of course, two things are needed. One is the security guarantee provided by the victory over Putin, and the other is the economic security guarantee provided by Ukraine constantly moving closer to the European Union. Thank you. Um, precise and to the point. All right. Uh, we have, I think, 12 minutes left. I wasn't, I wasn't told we'd have audience questions, but I think it might, what's that? Good. Over to you, Ian. Thanks, John. I'm Ian Brzezinski from the Atlantic Council. And we're talking about three C's, which is all about cross-border infrastructure development. I'd be interested from the panel, what do they think would be the most uh, timely and urgently needed cross-border projects linking 
you further linking ukraine to the countries of the three seas is it is it a pipeline is it a power line is it a digital line so if you have permission i think that first of all we have we already have so that the reality highlight this this, this uh, answer to this question yeah so that first of all the electricity grids so that ukraine uh, managed in 2022 2023 in fully integrate to integrate fully into eu uh, electricity markets in terms of technical uh, interoperability and, and com commercial as well. So, and before the massive shellings, we exported a lot of electricity to, to, to the EU. Now we are importing this electricity and we definitely need to expand this connectivity. So this, this trade already happens. We have really more demand in both directions because when we have uh, so that now we have a lot of deficits because of shellings russian russian shellings uh, and we buy a lot but as well so when the situation is normalized so our capacity to export as well so that, that and the to satisfy demand in the eu is also quite quite big so that's why this is the first first reply second big success of of our like of free seas is our connectivity with Romania in Danube Delta, and uh, because it's it's like very multi-dimensional projects of connectivity of railway, uh, uh, connectivity of river transport, and sea transport. So that's and it it we had this quad. So uh, Romania, Ukraine, the EU, and the United States on coordinating this mechanism, and we now see that it's the the uh, this corridor creates uh, a, of additionally more than uh, up to 3 million tons of grains monthly so export of up to 3 million ton uh, export monthly the biggest potential but as well the biggest limitations we have is with poland so that we have the biggest number of cross border uh, border crossing points with poland but what we see now and the the, the reason for protests of for protest of of uh, drivers is the capacity of border crossing points and how it um it's like it really like it's like aus, aus fix the, the trade because the, the because we have we buy a lot from the EU through uh, through the year and deliver for by road transport, a lot of pharmaceuticals, fuels, cars, uh, everything. So that, that our import from uh, uh, by so that eighty percent of import to Ukraine is uh, is done by road transport. So that's why road connection, in particular road connection with Poland is something that is extremely important. So that's why this, all these things, all this list of, of projects or list of, of uh, tasks is, is really comprehensive. And we already do a lot, but of course so that somewhere we have, let's say, better prospects, it was easier to do with Romania because of readiness of infrastructure. What we discovered with Poland, for example, so that's uh, in railway sector. So that the problem is not, the, not only the difference of gorges, so like 1520 or 1435, but uh, the, let's say, invisible commercial China wall be, be on these um, deliveries, on using railways for delivering goods from Ukraine to, to the EU through Poland. So because our railway was oriented only on seaports, and it was it was really efficient in terms of delivering grain, uh, iron ore, and other commodities to seaports, and that's why it's easier with Romania because it's like like shoulder on this. But with with Poland, we discovered that PKP and Ukrzaliznica they just they are neighbors who never met each other, so that they just discovered oh, so we are neighbors. Yeah. 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 Ah, so that's it's like uh, Polish railway and Ukrainian railway. So that uh, so that's uh, sorry for this. I uh, just jumped into regional <laughs> <laughs> reality. So you see, the free seas is, is 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 alive in terms of this daily daily discussion on 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 infrastructural projects in the region. Thank you. Other questions from the audience? No. Okay. I would like to add on that, that actually the border management and control system, I think the tender was organized several years ago, but it's not still implemented, the GoSwift system, I mean, which would um, facilitate the transactions. But I think also that we have quite a lot of uh, administrative burden to sort out so that we wouldn't end up in building new infrastructure and only gaining the minutes in the transport or hours in the transport, which we could have otherwise simply arranged by, I mean, agreeing that we operate as one. This is very typical of a free seas country that you have lines which take your 
goods outside of the region, but not within the region. Yeah, and this is, uh, thank you for this, because I just, sorry for interrupting, you know, just, I just, just, just like, when, do you, when the time is over, you just discover you have energy to talk, yeah, so. <laughs> so I think that this is one of the unique uh, features that was discovered and highlighted in last two years in the region. Because the biggest problem is that we use, so for last 20 years, we trained ourselves to talk to the very global level, at least to Brussels or to Washington or to IFIs, and not to talk to each other. And this is, this is the, uh, what was discovered in the first day of war, that we discovered that we used to talk on, on railway and connectivity with Brussels, but not with Poland. And it, 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 it created a problem we still uh, didn't fix. So it's, it's both regulatory, it's commercial, it's uh, infrastructural, etc. So that's why this is really now, it's a really unique time to understand that the region should talk, should be really intra-oriented. And this is very sensitive because you know that in the EU it's like always like a competition between national level and uh, supranational level and it's like part of political debate. But the task for us is, is just to combine it in, instead of competition to create some kind of Co cohesion of, of these driving forces. And this is something what I've, I've been talking about, the long-term trust to the region. So if we will manage to, to organize this dialogue between governments, companies on national level with involvement of, of supranational level like the EU, then it, then the free seas will be alive by, by itself with no additional push, with no additional promotion. Yeah, thank you. And the special notion to iron, digital uh, interconnectivity is there from the Ukrainian side, the others need to plug in and play, basically. John, if I can add, you know, let's remember the role of the private sector here. And the private sector is absolutely crucial um, that we see that public-private partnerships are extremely important. Um, you know, in terms of projects, we look at everything from, you know, from enhancing further digitalization. Um, Ukraine is resilient powered by digitalization. We talked about how we, we've raised 350 million. You know, we've put 50 million to work already this year in increasing R&D in Ukraine, creating jobs. It's become a hard currency lifeline IT industry. Even today, we announced an investment in a woman-led, start, not startup, woman-led later stage IT company out of Zhitomir, um, which is doing incredible things in terms of um, their you know, platform for marketing within the farm industry. So, so look, I would say this is that is that there are so many opportunities. Telecom, um, you know, we see telecom infrastructure, which those opportunities are there now. That's dispersed infrastructure. It's not one, you know, plant that that may go down. It is thousands of base stations throughout the country. That is an opportunity now. Um, that is a cross-border opportunity. It's bolt and build acquisitions. It's companies who want to expand from Romania, Bulgaria, Poland into Ukraine. It's looking from a long-term perspective that ultimately, you know, Poland has been the tiger of Europe. And you bring that whole three seas initiative together with Ukraine and Moldova, and you essentially lock in tiger status for decades to come. Not only looking outward from the region, but also in the at this point, it's a over 400 billion rebuild, but we understand that it will be close to one trillion, and that's a real opportunity. May I? Uh, two, two, two points. Uh, I absolutely uh, agree. I couldn't agree more with you. Um, first of all, uh, war uh, turned out that, uh, that infrastructure uh, is absolutely necessary to help uh, and uh, and also is necessary for for the business, and um, and especially uh, land transport as uh, as it was mentioned, and is railway and and roads uh, uh, both railways and, and and roads. I would add to this also the network and connectivity, high speed connectivity, be because it, it it's all about data right now, and uh, and we have a chance. To, to have a great connectivity within the region and with the entire world. Uh, and also, right now, it is one of the, one of the point, uh, the, the, the must-be point, in terms of uh, uh, investors. I mean, the, the biggest investors. They, they are looking for, uh, 
uh, stable energy sources, uh, green uh, energy, uh, that is, that is the, the, the name of the game right now, plus, of course, the, the, the high-speed networks. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, when we combine it with, with the infrastructure, I mean, roads, uh, uh, northeast and, and, uh, uh, and uh, east-west, uh, we have, uh, I think, a region for the future investments and mm -hmm. uh, with the great uh, uh, location in, in Europe and in, 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 this, in this part of the world. So, so Green energy, by the way, is also, I understand, one of the government's major themes because diversity of the green energy as it has by the nature is also very good for safety. So I would advise all of the region to make sure that our energy production is no more concentrated like it used to be in the 20th century. And indeed, Ukraine, again, can carry the flag here. Yeah, so I, I think that we must, last time in Tatra summit in, in, in Slovakia, and there was a discussion in Austria, for example, there is like necessity for renewables, but lack of free land for these like plots for, for, for placement of this uh, renewable generation. So it's Ukraine is, is absolutely natural in, in this and when especially when we are already integrated into electricity electricity system of the European Union. So that's why so that these uh, elements are growing quite quite fast and they're absolutely natural so that uh, but we see that this uh, growth is is under pressure of, of Russian war Russian aggression yeah. Let's, uh, let's also see that, I mean, how, what kind of guarantees for the first and fast investors there will be. I mean, free seas by nature is also multilateral, but we've heard also from uh, Mikhail Gawler, for example, that German government is considering kind of guarantees for those who are the early investors considering the security situation. And I think we should somehow try to also provide not only the free seas fund, but free seas guarantee fund, something similar uh, involving more donors to it. It's very valuable help right now, then we can start moving right now. Why don't you explain what you mean by the guarantee fund? I mean, if you now invest, then there is a considerably higher risk than in a normal world. W war that risk. That the rocket will hit yes, you. Yes, exactly. Despite that the Ukrainian uh, air defense is doing a fantastic job, is getting better and better, but there is no getting away from the fact that businesses globally and money globally thinks that even in Tallinn a rocket might hit them, I mean, let alone Ukraine. And for that, to cover that risk, some kind of guarantee funds need to be arranged. The, the, this is something that important, but I hope that it will be important like temporarily, so that I think that the, the biggest problem is that if we will wait to the situation when the risks will be bearable in terms of pricing or in terms of like protecting from physical risks, it will be unnecessary pause that will result in like decades of delay in future. So that's why we, we hope that what is now it is important to de-risk investments in Ukraine in terms of uh, security risks and war risks and also affordability of price because money are quite expensive now globally in, in, in the world. So, and for Ukraine, with higher risks, of course, the price is, is even higher. So, and for last year, we did quite a lot in terms of ensuring these kind of investments. As you mentioned, the German initiatives, we have 14 states that said that their national investments to Ukraine will be insured. So that France has did it, this UK and uh, the United States. So we have at least 14 states dealing with Polish cookie, so that has a new mandate, uh, it's been modified legislation that provides them an opportunity to ensure also the third state uh, investments which use like Polish equipment or Polish. Coca is Polish ECA. Yeah, yes, yes. Uh, but it's, so it's, it's not only, so it's about investments. It's like covering investment, uh, risks for investments, not only exporting products. Even Ukrainian export credit agency has in, in modified mandates so we can ensure uh, the war risks uh, for investments in Ukraine by domestic companies. We also have, uh, let's say, resume in private insurance markets. So that's starting from, uh, I think, that first week of January, we have new insurance policy, we call it Unity, that covers war risks for vessels moving Ukrainian territorial waters. And the price now, so with introduction of this insurance policy, the price for insurance for vessels in, in Ukrainian territorial waters in Black Sea is like a pre-war level, it's absolutely affordable in terms of pricing. So insurance is turning back slowly, but it requires, particularly now, 
the public support. So pub support of government, support of, support of international institutions. And we hope that Ukraine facility, so that the instrument which is based on each member, EU member state model of uh, resilience and recovery facilities. So it will for Ukraine contain investment pillar, which is exactly the guarantee fund for, 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 for investment. So this mechanics is important now, and if um, uh, individual states will, or within free seas initiative, it will work, then it will be really push for, for implementation of project, pro projects now. If I may uh, mention SMEs, I mean, Ukraine has fantastic industry, but I mean, its SME sector lags behind, and I think we should put special emphasis on SME development, because this is what makes economies always resilient, that you have a uh, thousand flowers blooming in, uh, in, in smaller, smaller towns, and, and, and this is something which tends to be overlooked by uh, multilateral cooperation. We shouldn't do so. I think and, and that's, and if I have to, I love, you know, the mention about SMEs, because between Horizon's $350 million fund and, and Western S's 150, half a billion dollars that's going towards SMEs that will catalyze five billion. And just to echo what Taras said about essentially not waiting. We can have the discussion, we have to have the discussion about war risk insurance for the larger projects, but in the meantime, it cannot stop investment now. And I'm gonna give a very vivid example. Imagine a retailer, one of the investments that we've made that had 836 stores before the full-fledged invasion. They had 100 stores that were destroyed or in occupied territory. That's you know 30,000 per store, about $3 million. We dropped down to 636 stores. They have 1,298 stores now. They're opening a store every 17 hours. They've expanded into Romania. They're now expanding quickly in Romania. They're profitable, no debt. Um, Avrora Vasilitofan, who leads this investment, doing fantastic, growing over 70% a year. We're not waiting. We're not waiting until all of this is discussed and the war risk insurance and that. Those who want to capitalize on the opportunity are doing it now and realizing that Ukraine's cost competitive. The people are incredible. We haven't talked about human capital, but the human capital in Ukraine, can you actually ever even imagine folks who are more determined, strong, resilient, able to deal with whatever comes their way. You want those people working in your company, in your IT company, in your logistics, in your trade, in your energy, in your retail company. And those people are powering these companies that are ultimately the kinds of success stories that we're just gonna see more and more of in the years ahead. I've been told we have to close this down. Mark, I'll give you the last 60 seconds, but Lynn will be signing up new investors in the back of the room. <laughs> Wait, we're already done, <laughs> Bunner. We're done, we're, we're finished. It's, we've, re we, we've reached our hard cap. Yeah, just, just one remark. We, we, we started with Credo Bank, uh, BGK started with, with Credo Bank, a program dedicated for uh, micro, small, and medium uh, companies. Uh, together with the European uh, Commission is, is, uh, uh, is a program uh, around 20 million euro, so it's not uh, huge, but it's the beginning. And I, and I know from from uh, from my uh, discussions with entrepreneurs that this this level of SMEs is very strong. Uh, th of course, they are smaller, but they talk each other. They want to business each other, and and uh, in Poland, SMEs is is 50% uh, of GDP, so it's a huge power. And they want to participate in the, in this process. So, um, so I think this is this is big thing. And of course, Ukrainian facility that was mentioned. There is a, uh, in in the second pillar is a is a, uh, a part of, of of guarantees. But also we have 50 billion of euro there. And uh, February 1st there will be uh, voting, and we hope that Hungary will not block it, as it was uh, on on December. So, uh, so I think this is n next uh, mm, uh, mm, uh, concrete program coming from European Union that we can use to, as a tool to, to finance some, some projects. Thank you all very much. And President Kondulates, thanks for giving us a new breath of impetus when you came in. Thank, <laughs> thank you all for attending. Thank you.
Хорошо. Раз, раз. Hello. Welcome to the media briefing, redefining the business service sector. Thank you for joining us. I know it's a lot to do today. Please take a seat. Thank you. Let me introduce the host to today's meeting. It's Association of Business Service Leaders, who was established in Poland 15 years ago and has been expanding in 12 countries in Europe. May I please for quiet? May I please for quiet? Please stay with us. <laughs> Again, thank you very much for joining us. Our host today is Association of Business Service Leaders. And we have actually two reasons for today's briefing. First of all, is redefining the business service sectors in Europe. And the second one, ABSL go to Brussels. I want to introduce the association who was established 15 years ago in Poland and now is in 12 countries in Europe. And this is very, very important. What do you see behind me? Because now a new redefining business sector is almost 40 million people in Europe. It's about 20% of all employing in Europe today. This is what really, really matters. This is the dynamically growing sector because we are, the number in 10 years will be about 50 million people. Now I want to introduce the two finding leaders of ABSL. It's Monika Słomska and Jacek Leverness. Please join me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for coming today. Actually, it's not only uh, Monica and me. I would like to ask uh, several other of ABSL leaders. We have actually 13 countries uh, across 11 organizations. So what I would like to ask is uh, also um, Christian to come uh, up on stage. Christian Merton from ABSL DAG. So, Germany, Austria, Switzerland. Janusz Dzurzyński from ABSL Poland. Adnan Bemen from ABSL Bosnia and Balkans. And do we have everybody today? And, oh, yeah, you're hiding there. Vivek. <laughs> Vivek from ABSL uh, Romania. I was hiding. Okay, so um, actually, you see almost the full founding leaderboard uh, of uh, ABSL, and that means ABSL across all of Europe. Because now, with the 11 organizations and 13 countries, we see it's about time to consolidate. ABSL and look to future growth. So uh, on Friday, uh, we opened ABSL, so not ABSL Poland, not ABSL Romania, Germany, Austria, Switzerland, but ABSL with an HQ in Brussels. And the idea uh, of this is to not only work better together, but also to look really forward to the future, especially as the business service sector, if you define it the right way, as you saw, we, we can talk more about those numbers in, in a second, really is huge in Europe. If we talk about 200 million people that are employed across Europe, 40 million people are 
in the business services sector. That means in outsourcing, that means in uh, support operations, that means across all of the different functions. Basically, these are the white collar uh, jobs that this association really cares the most about since 15 years and of course wants to represent that in Europe going forward. Uh, beyond that, also I think an interesting number is, is the, that knowledge intensive, so what we called complex type of services, so knowledge intensive business services, out of those 40 million, that's about 10, 11 million jobs in Europe today. We estimate that over the next few years, uh, the 40 million, the whole uh, sector as we define it, will be growing to 50 million, so about 4% per annum, while the knowledge intensive uh, piece, sort of the 10, 11 million jobs, will grow to 15 million jobs at 6% compounded annual growth rate as, as we move to uh, 2030. And there's some very important drivers to that. And I think um, instead of me just staying here, I think we'll uh, let the team here of founding leaders speak a little bit to um, what we're trying to do, especially Monica. Uh, and uh, also we, we hope for some questions from journalists and the public here today. Thank you. Well, go on, sorry. I have actually one first question. Why we need the redefinition of the sector? It's there. Okay. Well, the, the redefinition of the sector is absolutely necessary as we are looking at uh, a complete change because of the uh, requirement of uh, new skill sets, of the abilities, of, of learning, additional learning, because simply the sector is constantly evolving and growing and because of the recent uh, changes of the last let's say five years six years all the economic changes all the geopolitical changes all the other changes which are related for example to pandemic they changed the life of the business services sector in general and the sector started to uh, grow and evolve in addition um, Basically, the, the change uh, as such is also related to the fact that all the companies are trying to think differently about uh, how they reorganize themselves or organize themselves in general. So the, the, the matter of fact of what kind of jobs they fulfill and how they fulfill it, the matter of thinking in general is changing. Thank you. So maybe another uh, important topic is if we see the world is changing around us in the geopolitical changes around the world, it's a chance for Europe as well to focus on this sector in future more, to create new opportunities for our young people, to create new um, talent areas where the people can grow in the future. And that's the first time that this sector is seen across as well, across uh, different other industries. And we take care about it to address it as well at the European Union and all other important stakeholders. Correct. And today we are in the Three C's house. We talked a lot about uh, necessity to get together. Um, ABSL umbrella founded in Brussels is exactly this umbrella that brings us all together. Together we are stronger. And also reflecting on in our investors coming across through different countries and thinking about uh, strategic investment across the region, it's much better to face one aligned entity versus talking individually to different countries. So this change is inevitable, also from the very important um, um, aspect of, the, of thinking and paving the way for the future talent that is essential to work for the sector for decades to come. I was just going to say the same, that you know, just we align the same with 3Cs so well because we are the 3Cs for the industry. So, uh, and if you look at the organizations which, are, which form part of uh, ABSL Europe, you will see it actually stretches across the 3Cs. Yeah, and last but not least, this sector will keep growing because it's transformative. It is also helping companies achieve much better business results through centralizing workforce, transforming technologically, and, and taking it completely to next level. So, so as we have, uh, you know, various partners with us here today, very important for for you as well, because as we look at and the way that we have redefined the sector, there's huge work to be done 
especially when you look in the middle of the company. Because in our industry, we worked a lot on the back office. We have looked a lot on these hubs, but currently we really want to look at this holistically. What happens in operations? What happens in w the various roles that are uh, typically in, what, what do you say, middle management, um, specialist experts that are not only based in Eastern Europe, but in France, in UK, in Germany, everywhere. We really want to have a look at that and see how we can make the next big transformation coming, uh, come along. Well, uh, just as a last uh, maybe thought to that, when we think about really uh, how organizations work, you, you literally can think about you can do a job for anyone from anywhere at any time. And that is the def redefinition by itself in terms of the mindset of how, how we can work as businesses service sector in general. And um, there, is, there are no boundaries really for us growing or, or actually uh, developing further. I have a second question. Uh, you are in 13 countries in Europe. Why you need Brussels? <laughs> well, first, to make sure, you know, as we continue growing, that we cooperate better in between each other. As we've been growing generically, organically within the different countries, I think we're at the point after 15 years of growth to coordinate better. But also we have a lot of applications for new countries, so ABSL in Portugal, in Spain, even beyond a ABSL in Egypt, in Australia, New Zealand, the where, where, where they actually uh, want the formula to be able to cooperate better together. So that's point one. Point two, and I'm looking at Henry here. For, yes. Uh, you know, why, why in Brussels? Because first, we are in Europe. That's our main focus. And if we want to influence our business environment and our laws, we're already doing this across the different countries. But at the European level, we haven't really done that. So this will be, at the same time, also an opportunity to uh, influence various laws, initiatives. So one thing are, of course, labor laws and anything around that, data security, but also for the future, uh, in terms of digital transformation, in terms of ESG. There's tons of things that uh, we already see and the company, member companies are coming to us and saying, can't you help us with that? And some of those topics are very difficult to attack only from, let's say, a Germany point of view or Poland point of view or Latvia point of view. Henry. Thank you, uh, Henry Foy at the Financial Times. Thanks so much for having me. Um, one very simple question. I mean, you guys should be competing with each other, right? For jobs, for investment, for, for, for the size of your markets. Why on earth would you work together? I can't think of another industry where the, the differences in, in markets are, are minimal, so therefore the selling point is about your unique identity. Why on earth would you cooperate? And secondly, could you give me specific examples of laws, policies that Brussels has moved in the last, say, five years that sh you would have liked to have influenced if you'd actually had this operation, and how would you have influenced them? Thank you. Let me try to answer your question from my side. I'm from the, let me say, German section of ABSL, and I give the question back, why do we need Europe? I think we need Europe in general as well to have as well a united message as well to the outside of the world, and that's the same. The countries will compete in everything about investment and everything. But in the end, we are so close neighbors, so let me say relatives together that we have to come to a common answer. And it's the same in the ABSL sector. We have to influence the sector as a whole, and then definitely some investments are dependent as well of the abilities, of the talent abilities in the different countries. But the cake is so huge, if you see in the last 20 years or since the Iron Curtain was opened, what happened? Poland went through the roof with the services, then Romania came, then um, Bosnia is coming. All the countries, there's a lot of opportunities alone in Europe, if we see this alone. The, the cooperation, actually, that has been actually the success of the formula of ABSL from the beginning. Because on one side, you're right, 
Henry, you know, uh, obviously the companies that you think about, Accenture, I don't know, HP, Infosys, IBM, etc. But that's just part of the sector. This is the vertical part of the sector. In the beginning, we came together and said, let's cooperate where we can. And this is how it started. I mean, these were the first members actually 15 years ago. And uh, some places we compete and some places we can cooperate. And that was, the f uh, that was the idea. But remember, this is also a horizontal sector. That means, for example, finance, IT, and HR people across FMCG sector, that's also it, across, uh, uh, across industrials, across whichever other sector, that's still us because we're looking at it vertically and horizontally. And therefore, uh, we believe that this is good. If not, we wouldn't get applications from as far as Australia and New Zealand, I guess, for, for the formula, how it works. And on the second point, I think, very important, for not only for, for the vertical and also the horizontal part of the industry, uh, that showed COVID. For example, when you had people traveling and working on data-sensitive uh, topics and suddenly they were working from home, but they should stay, I don't know, in Switzerland and they started doing it out of Spain and Portugal and they created a whole set of different data privacy and labor type of uh, contract type of issues. Those are, those are, this is one out of many different topics that we want to tackle for the future as we see a new way of working. There comes an old word in my mind, what you ask, co-opetition. Collaboration and competition. And Henry, it was a tricky question because you know the answer. But uh, 15 <laughs> years ago, but thank you for that. 15 years ago, we started in Poland, and in reality, we had many companies sitting next to each other in the round tables, typically. And it was absolutely astonishing that we can sit at the same table, table being competitive in our day, day job. But going beyond the borders, sharing best knowledge, sharing examples, networking, inspiring each other, in fact created the pie, as Christian said, much bigger than our opportunity to eat it. So that's, it, and it, it continues to happen. It's astonishing. You've seen our conferences, our summits, and it speaks for, it for themselves. Uh, and then back to your second question, there are certain things at the European level which was stressed here in the Three C's House, AI Act, one, politics, one, one policy uh, towards approach to Ukraine, many, many other things that makes Europe stronger and be a very important part of the geopolitical um, uh, map. And, and we, as a humble sector, we definitely believe we can play part in that. So Brussels set up and that enablement is really to deliver exactly that. And the last point, capacity coming from any single country, even as big as Poland, is limited. So when we are now in 13 countries, very soon we're going to be in 20 countries, going beyond Europe as well. Therefore, we need one voice, and this is one voice. There is no better place than mention this as free this house, since it is exactly similar approach to talking about one voice of what countries can do together. And uh, for us, uh, individual countries actually, uh, we can be competitive in our own way, uh, but represent a sector is a different, uh, uh, different story, different, uh, different, uh, yeah, different story in general. And uh, for us, uh, having a representation in Brussels where things matter, where we can uh, listen and hear, and where we can also pass our own messages as a united uh, front, one voice, uh, it is really very, very important. It mat matters to all of the organizations joining EBSL. Jacek Pochłopień, Info, publisher of Dziennik Gazeta Prawna from Poland. I would like to ask you for maybe short comment concerning artificial intelligence <laughs> about impact on your business or, and maybe, AI Act, if we're talking about Brussels. Yeah, so AI, as any, ad any new technology, will help, obviously, improve productivity. We need it because practically jobs in this space, uh, joblessness is zero. So we, we struggle to find talent. So it will help improve productivity. Um, having uh, business operations move to the uh, business services obviously make it much easier to adapt new technologies. Huh? So AI, AI is uh, not different than that. So if you run uh, business processes in a classical way versus business services, adapting new technologies becomes much easier. Yeah? So overall, positive. 
and, and frankly, this particular sector, you heard Jacek speaking about knowledge intense business services. We are in the forefront of that change, transformation that Monica mentioned about. We cannot imagine that without AI, a common approach to AI. So this is a great enabler, also a, a, a risk. We hear about risk for last 10 years, honestly speaking, right? So we kind of get used to hearing about the, all the risks. The point is we turn it around to our advantage. What you see today is a walking example of the fact what we can do, and we're gonna do exactly the same with AI. Maybe just one last comment to this uh, topic. Um, actually, AI is very much in favor to our business because whatever productivity we generate, we actually gain resources. And because we gain resources, we can upskill actually and reskill these resources, which means that in the war of talent, it is a very, very beneficial thing to have. Instead of actually competing with each other and fighting for resources from each other, we can, all the companies actually uh, could really, you know, improve the way they exist today and the way they do business through artificial intelligence and utilizing it properly. Any question? Okay, thank you very much for your attention. If you uh, want to speak with us, one-to-one -one question, one-to-one uh, -one interview, just let me know. I'm whole afternoon to here uh, at the place. Thank you very much, founding leaders of ABSL. Thank you.
Good afternoon. I would like to announce uh, the President of the Republic of Poland, Mr. Andrzej Duda. Mr. President, thank you so much for coming. Uh, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. Excellencies, honorable guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great honor to welcome you to today's debate on foreign direct investments in Central and Eastern Europe in the Three Seas Hub an excellent showcase of our region in Davos. The main advantage of foreign direct investment is that it fuels economic growth, creates employment and fosters technological progress. Its true meaning is also act as, act as a bridge connecting the aspirations of a host country with the resources and knowledge of foreign investors. FDI brings knowledge, technology, and skills, among others. As a result, it's of strategic importance for almost every economy. Ladies and gentlemen, investing in Central and Eastern Europe can be a great opportunity for companies looking to expand and grow. The three seas countries are natural partners for multinational corporations due to their untaped investment potential and business-friendly environment. The countries of the three seas have achieved greater economic growth than at the developed markets. We are one of the fastest growing regions in a world with forecasted GDP growth of 35% by 2030. As members of NATO and the European Union, we offer investors stability, security, and very far, fair protection against corruption. Our region is located at the crossroad of key global logistic routes, which is particularly important now due to redrawing the course of the existing transport corridors. By 2030, the countries of the three seas need investments worth 650 billion euro, mainly in the areas of transport, energy, and digital infrastructure. Public and private investors could benefit from those investments either by contributing to the financial vehicles plant and as successors to the three seas investment fund or by running their own projects. Dear friends, despite the war in Ukraine, Poland and other Central Eastern European countries remain a safe haven for global investors offering resilient and stable economic environment, also thanks to our membership in key strategic alliances such as NATO and the EU. What distinguishes our region in the eyes of investors is, above all, its young, well-educated population, fast investor service path, and aid programs such as tax exemptions. Almost all market sectors are open for business and offer attractive investment opportunities. I strongly encourage all international investors to find out more on the opportunities offered by the Central European market, especially in sustainable energy and digital sectors. The data proves that we have enormous potential to attract green investments, which will also support the process of decarbonization of our economy. 
ladies and gentlemen. Big and the heart of Europe, the three seas countries have the ambition and capacity to be at the heart of the global economy and international value chains. That's why I encourage you to look closer at our region. I wish you a fruitful debate and many a success in speaking new synergies and pros prospective areas of business cooperation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Mr. President, for a very interesting and uh, brilliant scene setter uh, for this panel. I'd like to invite our panelists up to the stage now. I'll introduce them when they're all sat down, um, so they'll come up. Um, in the meantime, my name is Henry Foy. I'm the Brussels Bureau Chief uh, of the Financial Times. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be back here uh, in Davos for the Three Seas Hub. Um, and to be moderating this panel, which I think someone told me that they thought it was the most important one, and I wholeheartedly agree. Um, great. Um, as I said, uh, brilliant that the, the president took time out of his incredibly busy schedule to be here and also to set the scene. Guys, please sit down. You're making me feel uncomfortable. Um, um, today, we're going to discuss what I believe is the most important issue for uh, the region. Um, issues, I suppose. The risks and opportunities posed by the myriad challenges that we have, energy, security, talent, of course, uh, technology. Um, and the organizers, who I must not forget to thank, have organized a stellar panel uh, for me. When people say, so-and-so is a good moderator, it's nonsense. It's all about the quality of the panel. Um, so let me introduce today's speakers. We'll go this way around. Um, we're very, very fortunate to have J.E. Uh, Coffey. She's the Global Head of Enterprise Execution and Chief Corporate Affairs Officer at BNY Mellon. She's here from uh, New York. We have uh, Kevin Turpin, who's the Regional Director of Capital Markets at Colliers. Um, Pavel Nerada, who's the first Vice President of the Managing Board at Poland's Development Bank, BG. K. Tony Husch, who's, of course, the chair of the AmCham Poland. Agnieszka Owowska, vice president at ABSL, and last but by no means least, Jaroslav Krok, senior managing director for Central Eastern Europe at Accenture. Um, I know the least about all these issues uh, that anyone on stage. I'm going to speak for the least amount of time. Um, Pavel, I want to start with you, mainly because you're... Uh, <laughs> You have this wonderful role of being inside and outside, right? You invest in other countries in the Three Seas region, but you also understand the investment in, into Poland. Um, the president described the region as a safe haven, despite all the challenges um, that are facing it. How risky is Central Eastern Europe, in your opinion? Well, I think it's actually a very good question. Um, uh, if you look on the sort of global perspective, uh, uh, clearly the, the, the world has become a different place, uh, probably much more risky than it was before. But um, I think the world, and uh, from, from that perspective, actually the uh, Poland and, and the three seas actually still look pretty good, if not actually better than, than, than before. Um, uh, we have been uh, hearing and, and observing all of this, you know, uh, shifting in, in, in global uh, trade chains, uh, near shoring, friendly shoring, etc., etc. Um, I'm not sure th this is actually happening. Mm -hmm. uh, what I can see, especially in Poland and in, in a broader sense in the region, still we are pretty much benefiting from that perception. There is a lot of, uh, we don't have the data for the entire 2023, but 2022 was definitely the best year for Polish foreign direct investments ever wow. in, 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 in the history after the 1989. Um, uh, uh, so definitely, as we, we, we have heard, this is a region where there is 100, almost 130 million people living, 
within the European Union with all its benefits of stable legal regal regulatory environment, free uh, movement of, of goods, people, and, and capital, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The, these are predominantly highly educated people uh, with, um, uh, with a good appetite for, for, for work. And um, uh, and I, I I couldn't I mean it's not probably for me to to say in my BGK published development bank uh, hat but as an investor we have we actually have a number of funds and uh, also acting internationally in Europe but in particular I would focus on this three C's uh, investment fund. Uh, where we are one of the key um, uh, shareholders, if you if fun funding pay, uh, partners, if you like, and we have uh, we have invested as a fund about short of one billion euro in uh, in the three C's region. Uh, all the investments we have made are, uh, are obviously for, for following the the three C's um, three C's idea about focusing about uh, investing to the infrastructure, digital energy and transportation in infrastructure, uh, and um, I couldn't be more happy. I mean, from the from the from a purely financial perspective, the, the the returns we see on 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 the fund are really good. Uh, Jay, I'm going to ask you the view from New York. I mean, I imagine uh, just short of two years ago, you were in some pretty tense meetings, you know, there's a, a war breaks out in a country bordering three of the three seas countries, I think, I do that currently. Um, there's an energy crisis a couple of months later, costs are going up. I mean, was there a discussion about the risks versus the opportunities of Central Eastern Europe inside well, your bank? Well, we certainly um, paid a lot of attention to the well-being of the 3,000 employees that we now have in Rotswolf. We started uh, our presence in Rotswolf uh, in 2010, and today we're, we're the only U.S. headquarter bank in the city, but it's a great city to be in with 29 universities and 100,000, uh, which is a mind-boggling number of graduates every year. You can imagine the attractiveness of that uh, location as a, a important strategic location for us. But the one constant, irrespective of crises, uh, geopolitical issues, and what have you, market disruptions, is frankly the the, the consistency, the resiliency, the agility, the hardworking nature of, of, of our Polish employees. Um, and so I think that's a, cons that's a constant. Uh, we're also at BNY Mellon um, as America's oldest bank. We have the privilege of serving um, clients across the world. We oversee nearly $50 trillion in assets. And so the importance of frankly being a, um, a strategic hub that we can really focus on and growing in, it, it never crossed our mind that we wouldn't continue. Now, we are in the business of preparing for a variety of outcomes, um, one of which is, frankly, ensuring, continue to ensure that we're there to support our pol Polish employees who've just been so terrific um, as a contributing force to our global operations. Thanks. Tony, do you think that's a widespread view across all American investors in, in the region that, yeah, it was a few tense months, maybe weeks, but actually overall the opportunities by far outweigh the risks. Well, I, th I believe so. The opportunities do outweigh the risks, and I think we have seen consistent moves to enhance U.S. investment in the region, uh, literally from day one of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, with announcements that investments will continue, that Poland and Central Europe uh, are safe, secure places. Um, you know, the fact is Ambassador Brzezinski likes to point out that there are 12,000 U.S. troops in Poland and, sc and more scattered around the region shows that, that as a strategic bloc uh, that NATO is strong, the European Union is strong, and it's a safe, stable place. And I think the uh, attractiveness increasingly as more and more companies see the advantage of investing throughout the region and the synergies of doing so, uh, to take advantage of the great human capital that's there, the improving infrastructure. Uh, so I do think that uh, uh, we are far outweighing the, the risk with the opportunities in front of us. Yaroslav, you're, you've got obviously operations across the region, it, Accenture's a major employer. Uh, let's talk a bit about talent. Is, uh, people talk about talent in the risk opportunities category. Is, is it more of a risk or more of an opportunity at the moment? I mean, I remember when I lived in Poland and I was reporting on Poland every day, I was told, yes, it's great, there are 100 uh, universities in Wrocław, but at some point it will reach saturation. I mean, is talent a risk or an opportunity? 
Right, uh, let me first reflect that Poland is a great home for Accenture operations. Um, the very first projects we ran back in 1990, so just a few months after the Mr. Mazowiecki uh, government was established. And since the time, we have grown to 11,000 people in the country and another 11,000 people in the region. So um, the short story is that we are managing. We are managing uh, the talents. Of course, there are some aspects which we need to take into consideration as the investors. For example, you know, there is a um, decreasing number of, uh, of engineers and people after science. Uh, and this number decreased from 15 per 1,000 people from the age 25, 34, okay, back in 2010. And this decreased to 12 people, 12 students these days. Do they all so want to there is a challenge. Journalists? There is an educational challenge as we are sitting here. We should realize this by numbers. This is the educational challenge. Uh, another challenge, imp interesting, uh, I, I believe, um, is the connectivity. We have uh, nice fiber lines connecting our operations through the country, but in terms, for example, of 5G coverage, it is 63% only, it's far below the average of European Union. Mm. So when you think now with the transformation of the nature of work and home office work, it is getting a bit of, uh, of, of challenge, right? Uh, of course, there are, uh, there are other, uh, other challenges, but we are managing. We are managing them well. We are uh, hiring every year, year by year, we are hiring around 1.2, 1.4 thousand people. And these colleagues are working for Accenture International Operations, but equally we are supporting uh, our clients in Poland, working for the most reputed uh, banks, uh, energy providers, uh, manufacturers, etc. in Poland. So it's a great investment and great home for us. Thank you. Um, Kevin, I, I mentioned energy uh, as a risk opportunity factor. Um, obviously, climate change is, is happening. We, no one's denying this, and, and companies are keen to ensure their footprints are energy efficient, right? I mean, is that a, is that a risk in this, in this three seas region where maybe there isn't that same kind of focus, the energy mix? maybe isn't as green as, as Western Europe. I mean, as a, a major real estate player, uh, what do you hear from foreign investors when they're trying to set up big operations, big offices in countries like Poland? No, certainly. Um, I mean, for those of you un unaware, I mean, real estate um, is responsible for about 40% of global uh, emissions. And, um, you know, there's a, there's a long, long way to go to, you know, to, to, to making that more green. Um, and, a, and a large proportion of that, you know, comes from the energy mix within within the countries of our region. Uh, you know, not every country in our region has the right mix. Um, you know, increasingly, more companies are, you know, legislatively or legally required to report on a lot more uh, of their impact on the environment, and that and that, and that involves uh, obviously their usage of energy. And one of the, but you know, but also one of the best ways. Uh, to, to use energy, or, not, is, is, or is not to use energy, essentially, is to become more efficient. Uh, and again, there's a lot of efficiencies that, that buildings, uh, that companies are looking for uh, in their buildings uh, to, to, to be delivered. Um, and, and as I said, there is still a long way to go in doing that, and that's, uh, you know, that's also why, uh, as a company, we're also investing a lot into, into helping uh, investors uh, who are outside the country, but also currently inside the country, to understand those risks going forward. Uh, and just, just to finish off on why, you know, what investors are saying is that, you know, yes, they are concerned that, you know, some of the countries in our region, uh, you know, are, will be unable to provide that energy security uh, and diversity of energy source, uh, supply. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, that is, that is an ongoing concern for them. So we, you know, as, as a region, you know, we need to address that and, and get our heads around it. It's fascinating. Is that directly related to the fallouts from the Russian full-scale invasion of Ukraine or does it precede that? Um, I mean, I mean, obviously, the you know the, the planet's been warming up for for a long time, but certainly it's been been exacerbated by you know by the by the sources of energy that we you know that we were used to, particularly and predominantly from Russia, which has now largely been switched off, um, and now we're having to find other sources, and and you know, but but those sort of green sources, solar, wind, uh, hydro, for example. Uh, you know, we, we're just we're just lacking in those. Uh, also, atomic energy is also uh, a popular topic. Whether you consider that as green or not is 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 a, is a, is a different story. But uh, you know, 
these are long-term investments, and uh, you know, we, you know, that topic needs to be raised and, and acted upon um, before, you know, as a region, we lose out to to other parts of the world, for example. Agnieszka, I know ESG is your wheelhouse. I mean, it, it, is what Kevin's saying there chiming with what you hear from partners of ABSL, people that are looking to invest? Yes. Um, and earlier today, we heard that uh, business services sector has already 40 million people in Europe. Uh, and it's still growing, uh, especially in so-called knowledge-intensive roles. And um, we heard great examples from JE, from Yarek, on BNY Mel, on Accenture. Uh, I believe that for this sector, the one really interesting angle to look at the growth opportunities is in ESG. We will not be able probably to change the energy mix that Kevin was talking about, but I would see our role in tackling the decarbonization priorities that Mr. President spoke about today. Mr. President also spoke about talents, which we have great in the sector. They are the ones who know what business intelligence is, what reporting is. They can turn data into information and then insights, and very often, our sector is the one who is driving transformation within the corporate world. So with ESG, that comes also with reporting, there is lots of data that businesses would need to report. And I already see, uh, actually this was proven by the ESG report that we just published by ABSL a week ago, that 37% of our companies already have ESG reporting people. In their, in their structures, and they are doing that. So we can build on that and use the data into information and then using the transformational skills, the project management skills, we can really turn that into real transformation on how we can be uh, more ESG mindful and, and, and meet the expectations that everyone is, uh, is, is yeah, putting in front of us. So that would be kind of a bold statement, but I believe ABSL could be also an um, ESG powerhouse. I mean, I guess that's sort of part of saying thank you for the FDI, but with FDI comes standards and responsibilities, right, from the outside. But Pavel, I wanted to ask you, you have a good view on this. How does competition within the three C's region for FDI work? I mean, it's all well and good saying, you know, here in Davos for four days, we're all going to make friends. But ultimately, you know, Poland competes with Romania, competes with Greece, competes with the Baltics for investment. I mean, how, how does that work? Um, I, I think it's actually quite important to understand it. It's not really about the competition. Um, uh, it may seem so, I don't know, 20 years ago in, in the 90s that basically whatever you are looking on uh, how to attract the, the FDI, the, the in fact, the only, the only factor was who can give bigger waivers, tax waivers, or subsidies, uh, which, is, which is wrong, which is not how we, we uh, by the way, how we at, at BGK would, would, would look at it at all, because we are, we are looking on something much more comprehensive of, of creating value, not giving a waiver. Uh, by the way, we got uh, an example of Ford. I think it was a Ford factory near, close to Warsaw, that was open. And the moment the the, the waivers expired, they put together and moved it to, to Morocco, I think. Really? Over right, almost. But by the way, but coming to the the, the thing about the three C and uh, removing all these historical bottlenecks, limitation is that that everyone is going to win. My favorite example that, uh, that I experienced first hand, I was, uh, I was talking to, you know, there is a, this large container term, terminal in Gdańsk, DCT. Uh, and that was back in 2017. So that they, even at the time, they were having like 500 odd uh, trains leaving the, 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 with containers, uh, leaving the, the, the port the terminal, uh, going different places in, in, in Europe and also going south to Czech Republic. Now these could be, we, we don't have the most excellent railroads in the world, but still in, in Poland they could have like a 700 meter long um, uh, trains leaving with containers. So they were crawling back south and approaching the Czech border. Now the issue was the Czech infrastructure was unable to handle trains that long. So they would have to dismantle it, to, to tile it into, into something smaller. So if, 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 if I see 
I, I'm more than happy, in a way, to invest in Czech railroads because everyone is better off. Because everyone is better off. If anyone's here from the Czech railway, th this is your man. He's got money to burn. The, the, um, the, the same with roads. <laughs> Jay, I mean, I wondered maybe, do you have any anecdotes of, and we talked about talent before in, in, in regional, do you, do you see people coming to Rotswab to work for you from other parts of the three, th three seas region? Is Poland a hub for talent, not just Polish talent? I mean, is there ways that you can leverage the whole region? We do, and the importance of the European uh, single market. Uh, we're a global company. Finance is a global business. Our clients are either global clients or have a lot of ambition to be, to be doing more on a global basis. And I think talent, um, you know, ourselves included, all of us included, would like to think ourselves as being able to contribute across a variety of different geographies. Um, but to answer your question directly, it is still predominantly a uh, Polish-centered population, uh, but goes back to the single market attractiveness of you know Poland and other the CE region as a region as a as a destination as a talent destination, and we super keen to be a support of all of that. Tony, one thing I wanted to ask you, just given your sort of personal background and also the companies you represent. I'm going to segue a little bit in the uh, in the question. People talk about Ukraine and, and security for Ukraine through NATO, through EU membership, but through FDI, through you get American companies, you get um, European companies, uh, possibly even Chinese companies investing on the ground post-war. That is a way of making sure that country is more stable and strong. Do you see the same uh, maybe has happened or is still happening in the Three Seas region, that, that FDI has a role to play in national security? That it's not just about, I mean, obviously a strong economy makes for a strong state, but more directly than that, the, the know-how, the intelligence. And also the fact that American shareholders are putting their money on the ground, right? No, absolutely. I think when you look at U.S. investment, you look at international investment into the Three Seas region, it comes down to uh, a term that sometimes my economist friends think is not a real term, but I call it economic deterrence. Because it's not only the fundamental uh, uh, foundations of building stronger, well-functioning, high-value-add economies, it's also about engagement. So you have national governments, whether it be the U.S. administration, our European partners, our Japanese or Korean partners, that when the, there is investment, there's additional channels of engagement. So you have not just the security aspect, not just the shared values aspect, but you have this economic relationship that is important to both sides. And when you have that triad, of it makes, I think, for a safer region. I think the other thing, too, that is happening and not on a scale perhaps we would like to see, but we are seeing the commitments take place and the actions take place now to restore operations and in fact build some new operations in Ukraine. So there is a, a many actors that they're not waiting for the end of hostilities. They're confident that there will be a free democratic Ukraine and they're investing now or rebuilding those things that are damaged now. And I think that also bodes well for the entire region because for Poland, Central Europe, and indeed all of Europe to be secure, we need stability and we need prosperity and opportunity also in Ukraine going forward. So I do think that, that investment, um, while in our day-to-day -day business, we may not always think about it in that way, but ultimately we're also delivering onto the security uh, and the durability of our democratic states in the region very delicate way, beautifully put, of saying a country is more likely to defend a country where its shareholders <laughs> have money on the ground. Um, uh, yeah, so have you, you, you talked about connectivity and, and you referenced fiber. Um, the president in his speech talked about the crossroads here in the region. I mean, do you see, and also to Pavel's point about Czech Railway, do you see efforts to try to make this more, more of a joined up region for the benefit of everyone? Or, do, or are there still areas where people are more willing to think nationally? and to protect their own borders, to, to redraw their internal connectivity. Well, two or three comments on this. Let me first add to, to what directly to what uh, Tony said. Uh, Accenture is an um, information technology company, sure. right? So when you are asking about security, immediately uh, rings me uh, digital security, right? And what we should be maybe working in Poland and maybe in the region is the creation of um, 
national or regional security agency, organization which, which is putting the umbrella, digital umbrella, over the operations of the, the lives of people in the region. You see, we are noticing thousands and thousands of attacks every day. C cyber and attacks. It will, cyber attacks. And it will be only intensified, most probably, right? And these national security ad agencies, uh, they exist uh, in the UK, they exist in Germany, they exist in Italy. So somebody, an organization who is putting the standards of our behaving, how the society should behave in the, in the digital uh, space, mm. and uh, controls, monitors, and, uh, and at the end, defends ourselves. Mm. Uh, so this is, uh, this is for sure an, an, an important point. The other, talking about, say, physic physical security, Interestingly, uh, I read a report prepared by uh, three colleagues, I believe from Łotwa and Lithuania. They were analyzing the um, diversification uh, and security of energy. And uh, Czech Republic is ranking very high in this report for three or four reasons, and this is a good example for ourselves and for, for Poland. First is the right diversification of sources. Second is demopolization, demopolization of the companies providing energy in the country. The third aspect is the interconnectivity. Interconnectivity is exactly the cooperation between, between the countries, not only, say, on, well, on all energy sources, the more hubs you are having in the region, the more secure you are as the, as the partner of the country in this region. Mm -hmm. So, and Czechs is, is, is very, very high in this, in this ranking. The fourth element, uh, the fourth element for Czech going uh, very much in, f in favor is the way they storage the energy. Okay, they have, they had, they, they prepared big storage of the natural gas. Poland we are having also, but not at this, the same scale. I was struck walking here, and I'm sure everybody else has. Every other building is about AI, right? I mean, like oh. they they all they all tell you that they understand it best, and they can't all be right, right? Like that's that's <laughs> <laughs> they can't all be right. Um, but I feel it. Does, I mean, now I'm falling into the trap, right? Because I'm doing the same thing. Um, we should talk about AI, well, at least at least for ten minutes. Do, is that a threat? Is it a risk for the region, or is it an opportunity? I mean, you know, there are there are, and I know this from personal experience. There are some brilliant young, talented people, as the president said in his, his speech, in this region. Uh, but it's a global market with AI, right? It's not about where you're based. It's, you could have a computer server in Colombia doing work for a bank in America. Maybe not Colombia, whatever. Um, <laughs> do, do you, do you um, who wants to take that question? I mean, is, is the region prepared? I mean, are you, is there, has there been years of preparation gone into AI? I mean, I, I, who here would launch an AI office in, the region today? Well, our office in Poland is our fintech hub. Um, and so we recently uh, formally stood up an AI hub, right? And with the talent base that we talked about, you know, Poland in the region is very well positioned, assuming that some of the prerequisites that my panel panelists uh, talk about continue to sustain themselves, you know, cybersecurity, clarity of uh, regulation, et cetera. So the, I, I would view it as, uh, here's an opportunity, the opportunity is ahead of us, and there's an opportunity for the region to be a champion of responsible AI because that's, I think, where the sustainable opportunities longer term really, really lie. And maybe I will add on that because, well, AI is kind of part of our daily jobs in, in business services. We, we know AI, it helps us, we, we are friends with AI, and me being always an optimist, I also think about AI as an opportunity for ESG for the future. Uh, when Kevin mentioned energy efficiency, I immediately ask myself a question. If we give AI in the hands of our transformation guys in business services, what conclusions would they come up together to improve the energy efficiency. Because that's the, that the easiest thing, I guess, now to tackle without huge investments that we need anyway. But I would still say AI is a huge opportunity for us, of course, if we do it wisely, smartly, that's condition. Uh, but uh, yeah, I would also see that in ESG space. Is there a risk that um, post-1991, et cetera, there was 
a huge amount of work done in this region in b uh, by differentiating itself in certain regulatory areas from Western Europe, and and you could you could sort of play the differential with AI. It looks like the standards, the regulations are being set by Brussels and the center. So the same rules will apply to Germany as apply to Poland as apply to uh, Romania, etc. Uh, is, is that a worry? I mean, already Emmanuel Macron, president of France, has said that the AI Act is too restrictive. It doesn't allow enough freedom and creativity for European companies. This is a region that has done very well by being about freedom and creativity. Um, I appreciate it. Yes, oh, no, thank I, you, Kevin. I'm, I'm only, I'm only going to borrow what I heard earlier because there was a session on, on AI uh, earlier on today. Uh, and, th and that was one Isn't of the... Isn't that what AI does, though? It listens to what you've been said exactly, in the past and exactly. spits it out in different <laughs> yeah, ways. Absolutely. So again, yeah, obviously they, you know, they, 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 they talked about this topic and obviously you know, too much... You know, it's a good having the right balance because too, you know, too much regulation you know, maybe stifles uh, in, 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 in innovation um, and not enough, you know, makes people worried and concerned about it that it's you know it's just going to take over our lives and and we'll all be uh, you know uh, obsolete um so yeah yeah it's it's about getting that that right balance and obviously as a region we work you know very well together um and we respect that and we have there's there's mutual respect there but you know other regions of the world might you know may not have that and may uh, exploit that fact if you know uh, give, given that so but you know given the fact that you know in many of our countries we are short of talent i.e. physically um, we, we know we're not very large countries in comparison to you know m markets like India and China. Um, you know we you know we can use AI to free up that talent to to work on more you know other other more important uh, factors than than the sort of the, man the more mundane. So there's a lot of opportunity, but it, you know but it needs to be managed and balanced correctly. Yeah. Uh, sorry, Tony. I was, uh, I was just going to add that. Look, the discussion that everyone is having from the European level in Washington, around the world, about AI regulation and how you do that, it's literally the same argument we've had about the internet. It's the same argument we've had about personal data. It's the same argument we've had about you know, environmental and chemical standards. Where is that point that provides balance for prosperity and economic growth and stability without being uh, uh, you know, a wild west? Um, so I think that, that one, that this argument is not new. Maybe the, the specifics of it are new. Um, but it's not something that we haven't dealt with before and we'll have to do again. The second thing I would add about AI is why it is important that we get the regulatory mix right to be as creative as possible. Because we are, for lack of a better word, we are in another type of great power competition. And it's great power competition about technology, about setting the standards for the next who knows how many decades about what happens. And the US-European relationship in trade, investment, and technology is the largest in the world. If we want to defend democratic values, free markets, intellectual property, and fair trade, we need to maintain technology overmatch. And so it is important that policymakers uh, in every country and at every level understand that this is not just about AI. This is not just about deep tech or this tech. This is fundamentally, do we have a rules-based international economy or do we fall prey to less than open market actors? Um, adding adding uh, to Kevin and to Tony, and being a consultant, being a, a bit numerical, right? Um, we are missing in the region, we are missing rather thousands of people than hundreds, okay? The growth of, the, of, the, of this industry in Poland is from 300,000 uh, people just uh, five, six years ago. A AI? In, no, 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 in total, right. business, technology business, operations business, to 550,000 people only in Poland, right? And believe me that we can uh, employ uh, much uh, higher uh, amounts of people. So this is the opportunity for us, the opportunity to be even more competitive globally. And as Accenture, we, are already, uh, we have done a study, we analyzed 18,000 uh, jobs. Mm from all industries, 
and we divided the jobs into the tasks, and we tried to, an try to analyze which task can be specifically uh, performed by the, by the uh, artificial intelligence. And there's, there's of course, big range. This, the range is between 9% in some yeah. task up to 63% in the other task. The average is between 35 to 40%. So this is the opportunity, this is the opportunity for us to further grow, to be more competitive on the global level as the region. And as Tony said, I mean, I, this is another revolution. Yeah. We were successful with internet deployment. We were successful in the, in the deployment of uh, many other uh, technology aspects in our lives. And this is just opportunity. We should be looking at this as the chance. Well, I mean, most, most studies globally will tell you that the most, one of the most vulnerable industries to AI is, is the press. So, you know, maybe, maybe yeah. in a year's time, there'll just be a bot uh, uh, moderating this panel. But... I, while I still have the mic, I will ask a question that nobody here is prepared for, or at least I didn't tell them to prepare for it. Uh, last night in Iowa, um, a former president won the, the, the caucuses by the largest amount ever in history for a contested caucus. Is the possible return of Donald Trump a risk or an opportunity for <laughs> foreign, foreign direct investment in Central and Eastern Europe? Pavo, you haven't spoken for a while. I, I knew it. I knew it. Uh, <laughs> I think... It, I don't think it's uh, it's something that would that should fundamentally change. I hope, and because as we were talking here before, I think it's about committing of the U.S. economy to the investment in in, in the region and in, and and in Poland, and uh, I really cannot see how from that perspective, whether it's going to be Mr. Biden or, or Trump, how that could change this dynamic because these investments are here not because Mr. Biden or previously Mr. Trump uh, persuaded the companies to invest. Uh, you, you tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> but um, uh, I think uh, they have done it uh, from the business, for the business reasons, for the business pers perspective. And I cannot see how this should uh, immediately change that perspective unless something dramatic would happen to him. I mean, he has talked about nearshoring jobs, he's talked about bringing jobs back to America. Gonna put you on the spot here, Jay. I mean, could those jobs in Wrocław be moved back to America? Is there any possibility? I'd like to think that if we focus on growing the over overall pie, right, yeah, yeah. then uh, you know there'll be many winners. Okay. <laughs> I think uh, there's going to be one winner, yeah, and it's yeah. going to be Donald Trump. Well, um, Henry, uh, if, Tony. If, if I might, um, uh, while uh, I don't like to talk about primaries held on cold, frigid days in Iowa uh, <laughs> by, the, by the party faithful, but I do think that um, it's important to consider, despite any rhetoric you hear in the presidential campaigns so far, um, to understand, though, that certainly in Congress, as it is now, in Congress, as we would expect it after these the midterm elections coming up, there is overwhelming bilateral support for U.S. engagement in Europe, yeah. strong commitment to NATO. Um, so, uh, and in fact, uh, Congress has taken steps to safeguard that commitment to NATO through legislation. So I do think that it's important to look past the rhetoric of the primary in the campaign Anyone who can't see how important the U.S. European trade investment security relationship is, is not looking very hard. So um, I do believe that the bigger danger is just the, the, the corrosive effect that sometimes rhetoric can have sure. in, in, in shaping people's minds, opinions, and confidence. But I do believe that bedrock, that across the, the largely uh, 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 stable political spectrum in the U.S., the, the commitment to NATO and, and, and Europe is, is steadfast. Um, and, uh, you know, we will just have to ride the bumps along the way. I, I was only just going to add, I mean, nothing very uh, <laughs> intelligent, but I would just say that, um, you know, given the fact that, you know, his former wife and his current wife are both from this region, <laughs> you know, you would, you know, you, you would hope that there would be some sort of, uh, aff you know, affiliation here, but, um, it would, you know, maybe. <laughs> That's the kind of diplomacy we're here for. Um, Agnieszka. Well, the business services sector has already proven its value, right? And uh, we've been growing for the last years 
even when Mr. Trump was in the office. So I hope we are very resilient to all the changes and we still foresee the growth no matter of who, who will be um, the next president for, for US. Um, but we can, of course, explain to Mr. Trump the value of business services if this is, this is needed, right? Um, I wondered if there's any questions from the audience. Does anybody have anything intelligent uh, to ask? Far more intelligent than, than I would. <laughs> By which I mean, please don't stand up and give a speech. Uh, unless, of course, you're the president. And then you are more than welcome to make a speech. Yes, we've got a question here in the fourth row, fifth row. Uh, do you have a microphone? microphone? You can take mine. That's fine. I'll come and find you. Um. <coughs> Hello. Adrian Zinczyk, CMT, Charter Market Technician. Um, I'm a cryptocurrency enthusiast, blockchain investor educator. And blockchain is an opportunity in one extent and to another extent, it's also a risk. Uh, far more often than not, it's taken the public stance from the risk perspective and not so much from the return side. So isn't blockchain and cryptocurrency and overall uh, integration into the countries isn't this a rising opportunity for this very region? Thank you. I am not a blockchain person. However, I do think that if we can find ways to uh, appropriate, un uh, understand, and utilize secure transaction tools, in a, a world where increasingly we see higher rates of cyber attack, higher rates of disinformation, ways to protect uh, uh, intellectual property, to, to protect value and assets. Um, again, I think it's like we talked about with AI or anything else, we have to find the right way to do it because to not take advantage of it, we're leaving an asset and an opportunity on the table. And particularly, I think, in areas where people are able to advance, for instance, here in Central Europe, fintech much faster than we have managed in the US. Um, you know, there are some exciting things going on. I think we're still early days in that. But I think if, if we do it right, it's another tool in our ability to manage risk, provide opportunity, transaction protection. So again, I'm not the expert on it. But when I look at it from an investment and security point of view, I do see it more as an opportunity than as a risk. Do you, Pavel, do you have investments in in this space? I mean, yeah. Again, I'm I'm, I'm also I'm, I'm I'm just a banker, so I, I don't know really much about but bitcoins and, and stuff like that. But basically, uh, I think I, I would I would concur that uh, that's one of the yet another tools available on the table, and uh, and not only blockchain, but uh, some related solutions like we have been looking for for some time uh, on something that is called digi digital bonds when you can actually issue bonds uh, instantaneously. Uh, and this is also very interesting new tool. We haven't executed that, but we are looking at this. Uh, and it's about uh, making best of the available tools. It's like the, and again, coming back to the your question about the AI is, is yet another tool. It can be, when used properly, it can be very be beneficial, like a hammer, if you like, it can be, did you yeah, I was just going to say that, that you know, yeah, it's um, it is being used in real estate. Uh, it's being looked at, um, of course, as as an additional way of uh, of uh, from a, from a security perspective, tokenizing or or uh, uh, signing signing for for deals. But again, obviously, uh, we're we're in a in a heavy regulated industry where we you know it's about all about knowing your client, anti money laundering. You know, and these are these are certain certain aspects of this technology that's still mi very misunderstood. Um, and again, it, it takes time. You know, the real estate industry in particular is very, you know, very, very far behind many other industries in terms of technology, uh, and it will take some time for that to catch up, I believe. Yes, Yadzek is there. I'll run the mic again. Like there we go. Okay. Thank you. Um, I hope I won't take away your job here, Henry. But uh, what it, what I think would be very interesting but in, in very short form, if everybody could say what is the biggest risk and the biggest opportunity for when you look one year ahead, and we go person by person, the biggest risk and the biggest opportunity. That was, that was literally my final question, but you've taken, <laughs> it. you've taken it from me, so I have to come up with another one. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> well, guys, we'll start this way, actually, just to okay. be fair. Uh, Jacek, the biggest risk for me is the energy transformation. 
and the biggest opportunity is energy transformation for Poland, <laughs> right? Um, of course, we need to look at this not only as the diversification of sources of energy, but when you think horizontally, you have the production and sourcing, you have later the distribution and grids, and you have storage. And believe me that in many of these aspects, our technology, uh, we know this, is 60, 50, 60 years old. So energy transformation is the opportunity. Why I am saying that this is a challenge? I would say this challenge for two reasons, because in the foreign direct uh, investments, this $21 billion which came to Poland in 21 and another $29 billion in 22, mm. there's only very few dollars coming f uh, going for this uh, type of investments. There is 10% uh, is going for, um, for real estate, 30% is going for, uh, for manufacturing, 15% uh, is going for, 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 for banking. But not much is going into this direction. So there's a big role of, um, of country, of government, of ourselves to realize this, this aspect. And the other, so this is, this, the risk is, in, is, is with money, but the other is that uh, Poland is ahead of many important projects, right? We have a defense as, uh, as uh, our priority. We have energy transformation as our priority. We have communication also as our, uh, our priorities. Mm -hmm. So the question is that we need to select well and devote a lot of management attention, mutual agreement and commitment. This is the a bit on this uh, on the side. Thank you, Agnieszka. So I will repeat. Okay, basically stuff. the rules are you can't repeat one that's already been taken. <laughs> okay, as I said, the opportunity I see is how our business services sector in the region can play a role in ESG transformation with the people and technology. How we can contribute to to business, to society, to countries with decarbonization topics. The risk is obvious, it's the clock is ticking, we don't have much time, right? So we really need to double down on investments in education in people, so they have even better skills, and in technology to accelerate everything we do to reach the Paris Agreement 2030, right? That's six years away from now, so that's, that's the risk, the timing, and uh, whether we will be fast enough. Thank you. Well, I think in 2024, as everyone reads on the various headlines, we're looking at a massive list of elections around the world. And I think the biggest risk for the democratic family of countries uh, and the free markets is that we'll be so short-sighted around the world that we take our eye off the prize, which is a strategic empowerment of free market democracies and realizing that our similarities are much bigger than our differences, be that domestic or international or regional. Um, so I think that, that, you know, and look, I understand politics always gets local, but that is a risk So uh, that I, I'm concerned about. I think opportunity-wise, though, it, I think we are at a new era where there is so much uh, technological revolution. And it's not just AI, it's also in energy, it's in new projects and different things, that the question is, the opportunity is there in front of us to really try to put these things together. The question is, will we be able to do so in a rational way that benefits our economies and provides opportunity? Because we need to make people believe that democracy, free markets, private sector leadership is the right way forward. And to do that, we need to harness a lot of these new tools. So that's that opportunity there in front of us. Here, here, Pavel. All right, you have taken energy from me. I would say <laughs> access to the, to, the, to the available energy is, is one of the key factors. But um, uh, since that's taken, I would, I would then say it's uh, the, the integration of uh, logistics and interconnectivity, as we were actually discussing, especially for, 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 for the region, especially, again, in energy, but not, nobody says energy. Um, uh, and uh, the threat, uh, I would probably also second what, what uh, Tony said, which, which is the uh, war and the social unrest. Uh, and uh, I think it, it is, unfortunately, becoming 
much more real as a threat for 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 the world as it was even a year ago. So that's thank you, Kevin. I think I'll have to touch upon obviously obviously the economy. Um, you know, obviously a lot a lot of discussion here uh, this week is obviously about around investment and. Um, and of course, you know we're in we're currently in an environment where you know the cost of capital is uh, is the highest it's been in uh, in you know in more than a decade, um, you know, and, and the requirements to you know uh, to invest uh, doesn't need borrow does does mean borrowing money uh, at significantly higher costs. So so this is obviously a, a strong risk that you know those investments uh, will not happen because. Uh, you know the numbers just don't stack up, and you know we ha we have seen that in the last 12 months, uh, in, in 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 many of the investment sectors. Um, so you know again, obviously collectively we you know we need to address uh, what's happening, and of course these these all stem from many of the to multiple topics that, that have just been touched upon right now. Yeah. I would just very quickly say business friendly environment, and I don't just mean business friendly environment for large multinationals, um, because the the vibrancy of local businesses is pretty darn important uh, to us in Poland and the region as well. So that to me is the biggest uh, source of opportunity and risk, and it happens to be something that uh, the region actually does have a decent amount of control over. I'll leave it there. Uh, and so will I. We've run out of time. So thank you very much all for coming. I want to first th hold that. I want to first. I want to first say a big thanks to the president for for giving up his time and his insight today. It's a real. It's a real pleasure, and a huge thanks uh, to the panel, to Jay, to Kevin, to Pavel, to Tony, Agnieszka, and to Jarosław. I've been Henry Foy. Thank you so much. Have a great rest of your evening. Take care. <laughs>